So good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Mike Hattery. I'm a uh, director of local government studies here at the Rockefeller Institute. I'm welcoming you to our third, what is now our third annual research and practice and progress briefing. And I'm glad you could all make it. I hope, uh, I think we've got a great lineup of folks to talk to you today and some very interesting results from both research and practice. Uh, one of the very positive things this year is that we've been joined as a co-sponsor by the New York State Association of Counties, uh, NISAC, and Steve Aquario, the executive director, is here this morning, and he's going to make a few comments. So, Steve. What a great group. Thanks, everybody, for making the time to come here. Uh, and if you're viewing this uh, online, uh, welcome uh, to today's forum. Uh, a great group of people have come here today and a wonderful ad agenda of research. Uh, researchers and practitioners that are with us here. Uh, it is my pleasure to co-host this uh, event here at the Rockefeller Institute. Again, my name is Stephen Aquario. I'm the executive director of the New York State Association of Counties. Uh, we're pleased to be here today to sponsor, co-sponsor, this third annual local government conference uh, for researchers, uh, policymakers, and of course the practitioners that we have with us here today. You know, local government, all government, is changing. And you know, we see what's happening in Washington right now with tax reform. Uh, government is in a state of change. It's constantly changing. But in New York, local government is certainly changing. Over the past six years, New York has enacted laws that have had a direct and immediate impact on local government. The property tax freeze in 2011, the local government efficiency program in 2014, and the countywide shared services initiative enacted in April of 2017 with a September 15th, 2017 deadline. It required counties to pull together the locally elected leaders in their counties and come up with a plan for savings on their respective and collective tax levies. And today we bring together the wisdom, the experiences, and research of how local governments are working through these programs. Despite some claims to the contrary, Local governments have kept property taxes low, worked to find efficiencies, and worked wherever it made sense together. This has been the practice of local governments for decades, for centuries since our beginning. With the heightened interest in research on this topic, we're pleased to sponsor the forum advanced today by the Rockefeller Institute. I'm grateful for the ongoing interest and support of Dr. Malatris, the Institute's president. I'd also like to acknowledge the ongoing and significant contribution of Dr. Hattery of the Institute and the capable and talented staff at the Rockefeller Institute. Economics, the property tax cap, economies of scale, government efficiencies, public service, common sense, intergovernmental collaboration, improving working relationships with local taxing jurisdictions. These are the motivations of the local government officials to share services, and we continue to research and implement shared services initiatives across this state. County governments are regional in nature and house within our borders the other local government general purpose governments. These are the towns, the cities, and the villages. And together, these 1,605 local governments perform what's called general purpose public services. Special services are provided by different jurisdictions. And in the early 1900s, New York State did not delineate which local government should provide which service. And that's why we have today general purpose governments within the same county providing law enforcement, fire, water, waste management for a few examples. Later, when there was a need 
for those or other services to be delivered, the state created additional special taxing jurisdictions. That's right, it was the state that fueled the birth and the subsequent growth of the special district con concept of government <laughs> taxing districts. Now, there is a plethora of these taxing jurisdictions, and each of them, all of the school districts, the fire districts, the library, the water, the lighting, the goose, and the many other special districts that we know of today were enacted in state statute. In fact, today, because of these state-enabled jurisdictions, property taxes exceed, guess what? The state's income tax. How could that be? In 2016, 54.5 billion collected by the special purpose districts and the general purpose districts. And in 2017, 46 billion was collected in state income taxes. It's in this context that our governor and our state legislature have established the countywide shared services initiative to direct the work of the general purpose governments and maybe influence the operations and spending of the thousands of special districts the state has created in the past 100 years. It's my sincere hope that the research, the education, the technical assistance that's provided through the Rockefeller Institute will further enable continued progress in this regard. The Association of Counties is very pleased to co-sponsor and more importantly, pleased to head this endeavor on behalf of the membership, the 62 counties of New York State. Once again, I'd like to express our sincere appreciation to Dr. Malatris, uh, Dr. Hattery, the Institute, all of our speakers that are here today and our guests that are working to help New York counties shine us in the empire, shine on the empire state. So again, a pleasure to be here today. It's a very challenging uh, time in government at the national, the state, the local level, working together collectively, we can get through this period of time and improve uh, what we have as our governmental structures in New York State. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our first panel. It'll run about an hour. Uh, and this uh, panel was formed to talk about service sharing strategies. Uh, a couple of categories that we'll go over here today are promoting innovation in local government. And we'll hear from Mark Pattison and Ann Thane of the New York State Department of State and Tim Minichia uh, from Policy Innovations. And then we'll hear from Tom Citrino uh, and of the Benjamin Center at SUNY New Paltz and Megan Cook for the Center for Technology and Government on reviewing some of the 2017 countywide shared service initiative plans. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our panel. And Mark, I guess you're first up. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one of the things I saw the, uh, uh, described in this agenda was a question about whether shared uh, services work. So let me just quick do that. Uh, it, it, obviously, shared services work. Uh, we've been funding at the Department of State uh, shared services programs, uh, things that local governments came to us and said, we think we can save money uh, if we could get a little help. We've invested $80 million uh, over the past uh, 10 years or more, and we have uh, up to $600 million of projected uh, savings. So clearly, shared services uh, works and, and has been working. Uh, and it's kind of funny, only I think in government would you ask if economies of scale or consolidation works when every other industry in our lives, banks, supermarkets, you really can't think of anything that doesn't move to move to economies of scale to capture a cost savings and drive efficiency. So uh, we know shared services works, and again, we're grateful for the local governments who are the hosts or the places where the ideas uh, come from. Our workshop, our first part of this, is really on one approach uh, to uh, seeing if we can get past just shared services and bring some innovation and perhaps some transformational uh, 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 efficiencies uh, to our governments, um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. One caveat uh, that I'd like to say, in, which I'll probably uh, ignore or, uh, as soon as I get through with it, which is when we talk about local governments, 
there's no such one thing. Local governments come in all shapes and sizes, all parts of the state, all geographies, all different kinds of capacities, and are governed by a myriad of different uh, laws. So that's important when you think about what kinds of solutions would we want to bring uh, to things because, you know, there are just vast differences in terms of how local governments work and what kinds of problems they're trying uh, to solve. Um, okay, so uh, the other, next thing is that uh, this issue about how do we make local government work better it's something that's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, uh, every governor that I can think of, Lehman, Roosevelt, Rockefeller, uh, Cuomo, Pataki, uh, uh, Spitzer, all have had commissions or panels, Blue Room panels, uh, to study uh, the issue. And so this is something that's been going on uh, for a long time. It's true in New York, and it's true across uh, the country. Yet, the basic structure of local governments remains the same today as it did in around 1920. You can do the numbers in 62 counties, 62 cities. Uh, the only thing that's really changed was school districts went from very big numbers, 11,000 school districts, down to 600 uh, plus school districts. Uh, and I, I often say, I don't think anybody uh, is crying for the good old days when we had 11,000 school districts. You know, so you get through the change. Uh, there are uh, opportunities for that. And uh, I think most of those changes have been, uh, have been good. And there is a lot of support for shared services uh, uh, in, in New York State. Uh, uh, as I've said before, we've been doing a lot of grant making uh, over the years. And there is a lot of shared services, Steve points out. Uh, I'm a, uh, we were talking earlier, I'm a, a, a recovering uh, uh, elected official or a recovering uh, politician as the mayor of Troy. Uh, local officials live and die by their tax uh, rate. Uh, that's how they're judged, that's how they're held accountable, and, and so they're impetus is always to try to find efficiencies uh, to lower costs. Uh, they are not always in a position to find ways to do that because they're up to their necks providing basic services. Uh, and the question is, do they have the capacities to fully uh, develop the innovations and the ideas uh, that they have? Traditional grant making, and we can do a lot of that, and it works for a lot of uh, projects, uh, I kind of say a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, is that, you know, we put out an RFP. Uh, we say to you or encourage you, go get a consultant, you know. They'll tell you how to lie to us. We want you to lie to us, right? Because then you can tell us what we want to hear. And then after you submit the grant, in about nine months, somebody will announce the grant. And then nothing's happened between the time you put the grant together and the time there's an announcement. So there's a lag time. Uh, lots of things work, are less complex. That's not so bad. You see what we find with our LGE program, a lot of infrastructure. Not to say those are simple uh, or easy, but they're less uh, complex uh, sort of by their, their nature. Uh, an annual cycle, for example, doesn't really help when you're trying to catch momentum. An idea, you want to move it. We have a lot of people who've applied for feasibility studies. They get the feasibility done. They got to wait for the next grant cycle. Uh, I talk a lot about Hamilton County that we funded three times to do shared fueling stations. It's a great idea. It saved a lot of money, a lot of money relatively speaking. Um, uh, but it took them three grant cycles to get there. So uh, we are looking for, or we're looking for, ways in which we could uh, help local governments who are the innovators. They're, they're on the ground. They know the problems that they're trying to solve. How do we take innovation and bring it to market? And we're not alone. We're not the only place in the world that has tried to do that. Uh, I had a conversation with a guy from locals may know, George McNamee, way, way back. He's a venture capitalist. And he would say, you know, Mark, you gotta, you know, we don't, that's not how we approach venture capitalists. We know that's not just money. We've got ideas, but they're not necessarily technically able to bring these ideas to market or fully flesh them out. We want to go in, identify where their weaknesses are, provide support, sometimes capital, but sometimes uh, information, nurture them, move to them a phase, see where they go. Many succeed, many don't. That's the kind of approach that they take in venture capital. And that's not exactly the way government normally works. So we look for a way that we could model that. Uh, we look for a way where we can identify the innovators and the champions that are in local government Local governments are replete with innovators and champions who want to help them focus on their concept, build that concept early, 
our MRF program that I'm about to, we're about to describe uh, does that. It also builds in phasing and opportunities for scaling up or scaling down, because sometimes projects change uh, over a period of time. Uh, and uh, also, because it is not a competitive procurement, it's not to say it's not competitive, because it's not a competitive procurement, that allows us to be able to provide technical assistance uh, along the way. Technical assistance, by the way, not because we are uh, folks with so much wisdom and, uh, uh, and uh, ability, the state is no better uh, qualified, but because we sit in a different chair and we can bring to the table different kinds uh, uh, of supports. So uh, what we try to do with the Missile Restructuring Fund is to uh, build a new model uh, that would help us identify folks and bring projects to scale and perhaps bring more transformational projects uh, into the fore. Uh, Tim is going to talk a little bit more about the uh, research. And I just want to say, eh, not bad, five minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So um, I had the, the, the privilege of uh, assisting uh, the department as it took basically what was a few lines of uh, in an appropriation uh, bill and uh, that clean sheet of paper. And, and how, do we, how do we build on the prior success of LGE? Uh, but if you wanted to nurture uh, bolder projects, you know, we were mindful of you can't do the same thing and expect different results. So we wanted different results. We thought we needed a new approach. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes and, and not do justice at all to uh, something called Lean Startup. And this is Eric Reese, who, as you can see, is a pretty young guy. Um, and he came up with uh, this approach after having worked for many of his early years in Silicon Valley uh, on startups and uh, felt that uh, there was a lot of uh, wasted time and energy uh, in, in doing that. And uh, so how do we apply some of the lean principles to this thing called startups? So a lot of times uh, when I talk about startups in, in government, um, you know, I get these sort of scratching of the head and some puzzled looks and things like that. And um, in our view, uh, a restructuring, a consolidation uh, of services, a shared services approach fits the definition as Eric Ries talks about it. So let me give it to you. Startup's a human institution designed to create a new product or service under conditions of extreme uncertainty. And as we talked amongst ourselves, uh, that virtually every, uh, every restructuring project that we could think of you know, fit that definition, and that gave us some uh, some reason for optimism that this approach uh, might be helpful in incenting those innovators that Mark talked about to try to take on some some bigger, some bolder, some more transformational uh, projects. So you can read the book. You can um, you can. Uh, go to you know website to learn a little bit more. I want to just give you a couple of principles uh, that underlie it and, and talk a little bit about how they how they apply to our to our setting. And and Mark you know talked about that a little bit at the beginning. Um, entrepreneurs are everywhere. Now if we went out on the street and walked and asked people, you know, as they walk down uh, down State Street here, hey, uh, are there entrepreneurs everywhere in local government and state government? I don't like our chances of being a 50 plus one on the result of that poll. But I think for those of us who have worked in and with state and local governments, we, we know that's not true. I never met a single person, uh, and maybe that's a little too strong. I never met very, very many people who worked and spent any kind of meaningful time in state or local government who didn't want to do deliver services better, faster, cheaper. And um, they have ideas. Uh, but sometimes when given the choice between flying the plane and fixing the plane, uh, innovation being fixing the plane, uh, you know, they, are, they have no choice. They have to fly the plane. And so um, our role was to try to figure out how do we help people who, um, who want to try to do both, but they need a little bit of help, and that help comes certainly in, a little, in money, which you know, there's money in the municipal restructuring fund, uh, and um, but they need a little bit of technical assistance. Well, and that's how we got to um, 
you know, that's why lean startup and the non-competitive nature of all this that Mark uh, talked about uh, helped us. Um, it was critically important that we, not to, notwithstanding the fact that everybody in the room uh, was smart, hardworking, had experience, brought, you know, some ideas to the table, it was critically important for us to get outside of the conference room. And um, we did that. Uh, it was not feasible for us to go and be anthropologists and watch all these uh, folks who were trying to restructure as they went about it in their daily life back in their community. But we did get the um, Secretary of State to hold a bunch of round tables around the state, a half a dozen. Uh, more than 100 people came uh, and they talked to us about the successes they had and the challenges that they faced and, and this need for a little bit of help taking an idea and turning it into a project became an essential feature of the non-competitive you know, nature of the Municipal Restructuring Fund. Um, General Eisenhower, famous saying for uh, plans are useless but planning is vitally important uh, is, is uh, appropriate here because no matter how detailed, how eloquent, how rigorous the plan is, uh, I'd be willing to wager a small amount of money that for anybody who's put one together within a month, within a month, some things have changed. And so we needed to come up with a way uh, to be really flexible, uh, to give people a chance to incorporate what they learned uh, and, to, um, and to revise their plan as they went through the process. And that is an essential feature also uh, of MRF. Uh, you're going to hear, you'll hear more, maybe a little bit more in um, Q in, in the questions about this concept of build, measure, learn. And that too is an essential principle that uh, the idea is get customer feedback, put something out there that uh, in lean startup terms, minimum viable product in our case would be minimal, minimum viable program, minimum viable project, get feedback from real users learn as quickly as you can, iterate, put something out there again until you uh, find something that can really work and deliver on the things that you're trying to deliver on. It's just not knowable up front, no matter how smart you are, no matter how hard working, no matter how experienced. And the good news is that uh, this concept is actually um, catching on. So there are a couple of examples in the federal government that has used Lean Startup to design new programs, development, innovation ventures is a, is a program of, uh, in the US AID that talks about uh, how do we use this approach to uh, incent uh, uh, development projects around the world. Um, and local government, uh, city of Palo Alto, uh, put out a minimum viable website uh, at the most in the 2016 Lean Startup uh, Week, uh, the city manager, Hayward, California, talked about uh, how much better it is to spend a few thousand dollars and learn and iterate and improve uh, before you go out with a full-scale um, project, which, hey, may end up not being uh, what's really needed or is not going to be uh, effective. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ann here to talk a little bit more about uh, sort of interim results and, and take us home. Thank you, Tim. I'm Ann, and I'm a recovering mayor. <laughs> and having served eight years as the mayor of the city of Amsterdam and the past 16 months as the director of the Division of Local Government Services, I certainly appreciate the process and availability of traditional funding, uh, state funding programs. And because of my experience, it's fascinating to witness the development of uh, this rather interesting program, the Municipal Restructuring Fund. Um, it takes an entrepreneurial mindset to conceive of and implement lean in the public sector. Um, as we all know, transformative ideas are uh, to fundamentally redesign uh, local government structures uh, are perhaps the most difficult ideas to advance of all. And I know that truthfully <laughs> from personal experience. Um, so I'm endlessly impressed with the staff and Mark and Tim's involvement in this regard. Um, I know I share this sentiment in this room, smart is so good. <laughs> 
and these are very smart people that are working with us. Um, it's my task to talk about how this is bearing out, kind of dream versus reality. Obviously, the program was developed to nurture creativity and truly transformational ideas. Uh, this is a four-phase program that invites applicants at any stage of a project, from initial studies and concept to full-scale implementation. Um, it's inspired thoughtful engagement at the local level and in our division as we try to bring these ventures online. Uh, as of the last MRF review team meeting in August, there were 30 projects that are listed on our priority projects list, or the PPL. Um, the PPL shows commitment, collaborative effort, and thoughtful engagement we know exists at the local level. And we've seen this in other ventures this year as well. Uh, it was brought up the Governor's Countywide Shared Service Initiative and the $20 million Municipal Consolidation and Efficiency Competition. Um, over, over 400 projects have been identified to share services and increase efficiencies. Local governments are responding to uh, our local governments are responding to the state's carrots and sticks to inspire state uh, change. And at DOS, we like to think of ourselves as the carrot people. <laughs> we use the priority projects list to track project eligibility, current level of funding, and long-term progress of each initiative. Currently, there are 18 projects that have been deemed eligible and have a level of committed funding. 12 more projects are still in play and require further um, work, so our folks will be involved with uh, the associated communities to get them where they need to go. Our most recent proposal deadline was just last week, and we fetched another 21 new applications. So pending review of these proposals, the PPL should maybe grow to over fi uh, 50 projects by the end of the year. Uh, two of the mentioned eligible projects are in phase four, which is full-scale implementation. They represent a total eligible combined funding of over $850,000 and include the consolidation of two town highway departments in Chemung County and the expansion of a shared service electronic records repository in Tompkins County, which extends to Cortland County and the towns of Virgil and Hartford. Um, or, yeah, Hartford, I think. Uh, the cons Is it Hartford? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Um, this will entail consolidation of records management, information technology management and infrastructure, user support, disaster recovery solutions, and improved process efficiencies. Long term, the project may expand to include E911 uh, dispatch centers and interoperability of law enforcement, computer-aided dispatch, and fire and EMS software systems. The savings from these projects are estimated to exceed $2 million per year once implemented. We have four projects currently approved for funding under phase three, which is small scale implementation. Approved funding amounts to over $1.9 million and they are eligible for about 3.3 million once they get to full scale implementation. Uh, these projects include consolidation of police services, water infrastructure systems, and regional code enforcement. The remaining 12 projects are all in phase two and the project development or planning phase. The f this phase sets up management and organizational processes required for implementation and requires the um, identification of pilot projects and large uh, strawberries, I think. Funding for projects under this phase are limited to no more than $50,000 per project. Currently, there is over 420000 allocated to phase two projects. This is also where we see the opportunity for significant transformation of an idea. And these projects include potential police consolidations, countywide emergency service consolidations, large scale municipal consolidation, development of health insurance consortiums, regional wastewater systems, town and village DPW con consolidations, and multi-county uh, E911 and emergency dispatch. 
At this point, I'd like to share a few examples of the program in action. In Chautauqua County, the village of Sinclairville and the towns of Charlotte and Jerry have decided to pursue full consolidation. And this is a big deal. Consolidations of local governments have long been a priority for the governor in an effort to pro promote efficiency and to save taxpayer dollars. These communities estimate that they will save over $600,000 annually. In Wyoming County, local leaders recognize the growing need for change in the delivery of emergency services and are developing a countywide solution. Currently, the situation is deteriorating there in this regard. There are 18 first responder operations consisting of five uh, uh, fire companies and departments as well as one uh, for-profit paid organization, which provide only partial coverage for the county. The number of EMS responders has been steadily declining over the past decade, while the EMS call volume has been increasing, which in turn stresses the entire system. In some, um, uh, in some areas, taxpayers are supporting infrastructure expenses for EMS agencies that cannot respond to calls. Estimates are that a coordinated county-led system could provide better service and produce over $1 million in annual savings. In Niagara County, 21 local governments are working to implement the Niagara County Municipal Health Insurance Consortium to achieve cost savings and financial stability. And this has really been identified as a, um, an area where local governments can um, look to, uh, for savings and as was shown yesterday at our conference. This project will help these local governments apply for New York State approval of the cooperative, set up an organizational structure and budget, and implement the consortium. Annual savings from this project are currently estimated to exceed $10 million. These few projects show the strength of our determination and our impulse to work together creatively for the common good. Ultimately, that's what this organically structured MRF process is about. That said, the MRF, MRF program is still transforming, which brings me to the messiness of innovation. I love this slide. It's a perfect metaphor for this lean process. Continuous improvement depends uh, on aligning three Ps, purpose, process, and people. And no disrespect to anyone, but once people are involved, especially at the local level, in my experience, uh, things get messy. But messy is good because that means folks are engaged. The, sex, the success of any, and this is a human chair, by the way. These people are in a circle and they are all seated. So <laughs> the success of any lean transformation depends on the engagement of many, many people. Certainly, we work closely with CEOs, planners, and developers from the communities we are active in, but our employees are engaged in new ways as well. Our team huddles every week to brainstorm, problem solve, and maneuver. And this is how we are learning from our own implementation activities. Again, this pro program is structured so differently from more traditional funding programs. We are learning and reshaping expectations, both of our constituents and within the state structure itself. So it's really exciting and something we are very proud of. Uh, this program was designed with the maximum amount of flexibility possible. We mean to promote investment in an idea, so long as it is supported by the involved local governments and is big enough as defined by the MRF program rules. Again, we insist on projects that may be deemed transformational. This support is something, uh, this support of something conceptual, not fully conceived and shovel ready is truly novel. Um, our commitment does not require any question to be uh, every qu question to be answered or every challenge to be overcome. Rather, we expect the process to be hard, and that the phased process, as described by Mark and Tim earlier, will enable continuous growth and redefinition of a great idea, and will uh, provide needed support of innovation. This program charts a new way to solve complex pro problems by bringing innovative concepts to the public sector. Um, it's responsive, it's nimble, 
It's, and it, it has a natural confluence with our other programs, the CWSSI and the MCEC, the uh, Municipal Consolidation and Efficiency Competition. Our challenge is to learn from our own processes to maintain flexibility while building the most aggressive and flexible program for local government. I thought this Garth Stein quote appropriate, the car goes where the eyes go, because we need to be looking ahead to where we want to be in this program and in our communities and in this state. With this program, we really are looking ahead at common goals, at serving our constituents, um, at investing to inspire for cost savings, for efficiencies and innovation, uh, all priorities of the governors. We're clear-eyed and we're looking straight ahead. So with that, that's our wrap up. We've got uh, time for questions. I'm gonna do questions after everybody. Oh, after, oh, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, you want me to talk from the podium? I think I can see it better from there. There right? you go. So uh, that's what I'll do. Uh, A little. <laughs> okay, uh, many of you submitted uh, countywide shared services plans, and I'm one of the few who read every one of them. So, uh, this is a summary of what we found by reading those plans. Is it okay to stand here? Okay. I can see good from here. Um, so, Steve already talked about the tight, the tight timeline. I think that's the importance of that slide. I think the other thing that's important it's is... a low blow, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that's important is the state did build into the process. If you couldn't uh, make that tight deadline, there was a process to be able to do it in the following year. I think the other uh, important point is that the state is going to match... Um, whatever savings you can actually generate in those plans. If you submitted them this year, the match is what you save in 218. If you submit them next year, the match is what is in 219. Um, okay, 60% of the eligible counties submitted plans, 34 out of 57. Nine of those uh, plans included school districts, uh, including Albany County. Um, as many of you know, there was uh, uh, required financial information that you had to provide in these plans uh, relating to your property tax levy, including the property tax levy of the special districts within the county. You also then had to figure out what your average savings would be per homeowner, per business owner, um, and seven of the counties that did file plans did not provide that information. Uh, in addition, many of them did not provide uh, a lot of detail on how they figured out their savings uh, estimates. Overall, in uh, 2018, from the 34 counties that submitted plans, there are 389 projects that will generate $208 million in savings. Uh, the recurring savings are lower in the out years. I, I want to make a point about the $208 million savings in the first year. $128 million of that is one project in one county. It's uh, a combined wastewater treatment plant uh, that Nassau County and Long Beach are doing. And I gather the savings is because, and uh, the plan isn't all that detailed and how it arrived at that $128 million figure. Uh, but I gather that's the difference between Long Beach building a wastewater treatment plant and Nassau County building one rather than one combined. So if you take that $128 million out, you'll see that the savings are pretty similar uh, in the out years from the first year. Um, the different types of projects uh, that were identified, uh, um, the major ones are pretty obvious. Uh, a lot to do with pooling insurance, particularly health insurance and health insurance consortiums. Uh, a lot of consolidation of emergency services, uh, and, in, and that includes uh, joint dispatch, uh, consolidation of courts, uh, energy procurement in particular, uh, the uh, creation of community choice aggregations, 
where communities can join together to try to bid out their energy cost. Um, joint purchasing is always a favorite one, shared personnel and equipment. Uh, those are the different major ones that happened. You'll see that the, uh, again, sewer, water, and waste treatment systems, that's 131 million, but 128 of it is one project. So if you stack that out, it's three million, okay? Um, when you look at the tax savings in the first year, those are the five counties that have the greatest tax savings. Again, I explained to you that of that 130 million in Nassau County, 128 million is one project. Um, Broome County, uh, Suffolk County, Dutchess County, and Monroe have the next highest. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at what they are doing to generate those savings. Uh, Broome's major savings is emergency, uh, consolidated emergency communication system. Uh, Suffolk County's uh, is mostly uh, a better way of doing joint purchasing through uh, an innovative uh, portal, IT portal that uh, Suffolk is creating. Uh, Dutchess County uh, is uh, going to do a workman's comp workers' compensation pool where they think they can make a great deal of savings. Monroe County uh, is uh, health insurance consortiums. So uh, when you do the out year savings, uh, the new entries into that are Albany. Albany's is mostly due to two projects, Health Insurance Consortium and uh, Community Choice Aggregation where communities pool to bid for energy cost. Uh, Mon Montgomery County has uh, doing a lot of things on the old Beech Nut site in Canajahari, uh, including uh, consolidating the village and town and a court consolidation that would have a consolidated court at the old Beech Nut site. Um, Erie County, uh, most of their savings has to do with, uh, instead of individual towns and cities doing hazardous waste collection, a county-wide hazardous waste collection. Um, this slide talks about the, that goes from highest property tax burden uh, per capita, Westchester, to lowest and then was looking at the total savings that you were able to, that the plans generate, uh, you would be hoping that your counties with the highest property tax burden would have the highest savings. You'll notice that that isn't true, okay? Uh, it's true in some cases. Suffolk did very well. Dutchess did very well. But... Uh, the counties with the highest tax burden did not necessarily generate the highest savings. Uh, in this particular case, Westchester was particularly disappointing. Um, and uh, again, that's what this slide says, highest property tax burden, and they had pretty low savings in their plan. Uh, Suffolk County did a lot better. They also have a pretty high tax savings, uh, tax property tax burden. Uh, their plan was a lot more innovative in savings and, and in generating recurring savings. Um, we point out there that Montgomery County, who has uh, a middling property tax burden, did a very good job uh, in generating savings. And again, a lot of that has to do with the innovative use of the Beech Nut site where they are consolidating a number of uh, courts and other projects at that site. Um, this looks at, okay, how much annual taxpayer savings do you get uh, in each of these plans? Uh, the title says 218, that really is the out year savings for property tax uh, savings per person. Uh, and again, it's not surprising that the counties that I identified that had the greatest overall savings generate the greatest savings per taxpayer. Um, and that is not in the first year, but in the third year or out year implementation. Um, again, some 
for instance, some counties did not give us but one year of savings estimates. They didn't provide us estimates for out years. So we took their one year and assumed it was uh, also a savings in the out year. Except for Nassau, which we knew was a one-time savings, and you can see that we eliminated them from the chart for that particular reason. Um, there's no question that there was a great deal of variation on uh, counties explaining to us how they got their cost savings. Uh, Chautauqua and Schenectady County provide a tremendous amount of detail, as did Albany County, uh, Columbia and Wyoming, and uh, many others provided very little. Um, and of course, the state isn't matching what your plan says you will save. The state is going to match what you actually save. So we expect actual savings perhaps to be different than projected savings, um, particularly in the first year. And, and, and not to knock counties, but if you're doing big out, I mean, you can't generate significant cost savings in one year with a big idea. It takes time. A health insurance consortium under current rules and regulations takes a minimum of two years to get started, probably longer to generate real savings. So big ideas sometimes don't generate savings, certainly in the first year of trying to implement them. Um, this chart tries to show you uh, what, what type of county leaders were more able to get a report in uh, in 2000, in this year, in the first year deadline. And what that sort of shows is that elected county executives, uh, most of them were able to get their plans in uh, using other types of uh, systems, legislative chair, administrator, county managers, higher percentages of deferring. Um, and again, I didn't, we didn't look at that to size, but I think elected executives tend to be in the big, bigger counties. Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So size probably has a much to do with that. Right, right. Um, and again, we think Montgomery did a tremendous job uh, with their resources, uh, an excellent job on their things. Um, when we went through the plans, we tried to look at, other than the, uh, Complaints. I'm good, I think. Uh, other than the complaints that every county made about mandates, all right, almost every plan uh, had two common things. First, they complained about mandates, uh, Taylor Law mandates, and other mandates that are not likely to be easily changed. Uh, and all of them talked about all the things they've done prior to 2017 as relates to shared services. But they also identified barriers, things that the state can do to make it easier to share services. Health insurance, justice court consolidation, changes in the education law, property tax assessing and debt refinancing. Um, the major impediments to health insurance savings are state laws and regulations that require smaller communities to be community rated. If you have less than 50 employees or less than 100, you have to be community rated. That means you're going to pay more. That's the simplest way of putting it. Um, you can't buy stop gap insurance if you're a small municipality. Uh, the process to create a health insurance consortium is extremely cumbersome. Tompkins County can attest to that. I believe Tompkins County spent three to four years trying to negotiate the Article 47 process in order to get a health insurance consortium together. That's too long, uh, and uh, the Department of Financial Services needs to streamline that process uh, or to give us other options to do consortiums. Um, there's confusion about Article 44, which is basically a, um, a, a plan that allows you to create a health insurance fund with your unions. Uh, there's still confusion as to whether they can be community rate, whether they can get out of the community rating law or not. I asked that question yesterday, and I, the answer was most of the time, which isn't a great answer. Um, the uh, some changes that we think uh, that would help on health insurance is to, uh, like I said, to uh, allow 
municipalities under all these different ways of forming consortiums to not be community rated regardless of their size of their municipality. And um, the uh, other thing, one is either to exempt them from community rating by law. The other idea is to give the Department of Financial Services the discretion uh, to do that. And probably we should pursue both at the same time. Hard to get a law change, particularly in one year, even if the governor and legislative leaders might be in, uh, in favor of it. Uh, so probably pursue those both at the same time. Um, another problem is uh, a BOCES uh, tried to form a health insurance court, uh, consortium in um, uh, all the capital region. Um, there are laws that stop them from being able to rebate, because when you create a consortium, you're an insurance company, in essence. And you're governed by insurance law, and you can't rebate uh, your fees that you're supposed to get that you don't want because you're doing this to try to save money, you can't rebate them to your municipalities. That's sort of a problem. Uh, right now, uh, education law doesn't expressly allow BOCES to form a subsidiary public benefit corporation to provide either pharmacy or health insurance. Uh, DFS is committed based on yesterday's uh, conference the Department of State have, to working with municipalities, putting together a working group so we can make progress on getting health insurance consortiums for municipalities done in a quicker and faster manner. The truth is that is a huge cost driver for all municipal governments, and if we can bring those costs down, that's a significant cost savings. Um, Justice courts have the same problem. Uh, the, if you want to combine a court in your, in your county or town or village, um, it takes a long time. The process is cumbersome. And when you end up consolidating the courts, the law still requires the consolidated judge to keep separate books for each of the municipalities so they can divide the fine revenue correctly. Uh, I don't know why you couldn't just take a five-year average of what your fine revenue was and divide it that way. But um, education law impediments, uh, shared services, if you purchase them from a county, they're not reimbursable under the state education law. Whether or not they're cheaper than what you could get them from BOCES, even BOCES supports changing the law to create some competition to allow that kind of purchase. Also, if a school district wants to set up a solar facility and it, it can't set up one outside its school district boundaries, it's not allowed to do that. So it couldn't combine with a city that might be outside its boundaries and share a solar project. That's not allowed under state education law. That doesn't seem to make any sense, particularly for smaller school districts in urban areas that may not have the room for a solar farm. You might want to change that. Big five school district cannot purchase from POCES. That's another possible change. Property tax assessing. Um, if the county wants to assume that for a town, you can only do it on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, unlike villages, when they dissolve their assessing power, that happens and it's done forever. That law should probably also be changed so when a county takes over assessment from a town, it takes it over permanently. Rather, because if you go back and forth, it's going to create a lot of assessment issues and problems. Uh, the last one is refinancing debt. One of the ideas we had in Albany County was to have the county refinance all its municipality's debt. Apparently, bond council says you can't do that. He hasn't articulated exactly why you can't do that. Uh, but th that could be a big cost savings if, because when you, when you refinance a large amount of debt, you can get a better deal on your interest rates. Um, recommendations, the better plans, clear goals, timelines, and methodologies for savings. We believe there should be a permanent shared service panels at the county level so that there's something in place to do this on an annual basis. Uh, formal technical assistance, 
ongoing financial incentives, uh, trying to get more common financial reporting. When you read these plans, uh, everybody had a different way of calculating savings, uh, and that makes it hard to compare the plans. Uh, counties should be important in organizing shared services, but they don't always have to be the provider of shared services. They could be an organizer that allows towns to share services better. School districts should be participating in these panels. Um, in Albany, we did that and we learned a lot. And finally, which will lead to Megan's presentation, Technology is very important to implementing shared services, so it cannot be an afterthought. And unfortunately, in most of these plans, it was, as Megan will talk about. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I know you've been sitting a long time. I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly. Um, in reading all the plans, there was a couple of things that jumped right out when you're thinking about technology. And let me just go here. Um, there was a lot of language differences, and so that goes to the fact um, what people mean when they propose a shared services, because some of them were managed service, some were a co-location of service, and some were a true shared service. And does that matter? It does matter when you get into governance, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we also noticed that some of the plans, although had big cost savings, didn't really have a lot of substantial information about how they were going to get there. And devil is in the details, as, as we know. Um, some of the things that IT was an enabler, or it was the focus, and many of the plans didn't identify the organizational barriers that might exist in using technology. So we put a couple of those uh, in this presentation. Um, and then at the end, uh, a little input from county IT directors that we were able to gather. So again, the managed service, the shared service, the co-location of services. If, uh, if a county was going to propose a portal for procurement, it wasn't actually clear that it would be shared. It, it looked on paper like it might be procurement through the same portal. So is that a shared service? Um, and if it is to be a shared service, thinking about the business processes that are underlying each of the procurement, the policies that govern those. A managed service, having someone else take care of your technology needs, you're paying them, but you're not really sharing in the risk. And so these play a part when you're figuring out who makes decisions about what, especially when a lot of these had um, critical data embedded in all of these systems. So IT is the focus and IT as the enabler. So if a project said we're going to have this shared system, that is where it's the focus. There was a lot more description around there. Or IT as an enabler. When I gathered county IT directors and listed out all the possible shared services ideas out there, I asked them to identify which ones didn't have technology embedded in them. They did identify one, but then they had a big debate over it, and it was the healthcare consortia. But still, when you come down to that, it's sharing of files and information and still creates work for the IT group. So that's how we really saw the technology uh, within the plans. We're big proponents of the 80-20 rule. 80% of your time comes in thinking about how it's going to work, so you only spend 20% in implementation. If you spend 20% of your time in thinking about how it's going to work, you're going to spend 80% of your time in implementation. And, and what, That's a good one. what we think about a lot of times is what are the underlying policies and processes that have to go into um, a shared service IT program? So... We've been thinking at CTG about critical success factors for these projects for 25 years. Everything such as leaders and champions to organizational compatibility. We do an assessment of collaboration. Everybody says, oh, of course we're going to collaborate. Do you know how to collaborate? Do we know what it means? It doesn't mean cooperation. I like the fact that we're talking a lot about Tompkins County. They were named one of the U.S. most digital counties in the United States a couple of years ago.
But if you talk to Greg Potter and Maureen Reynolds, they've had a 20-year relationship. They've gotten many shared, um, excuse me, state archives grants together. And now this new municipal restructuring fund, I had the privy to be part of conversations between Cortland County and Tompkins County. And a lot of it is built on the trust between the people of working together. So the five components of governance, and we're working through this right now at CTG with four cities in looking to share uh, information about code enforcement and blight, and really understanding the scope of what they want to share, the authority of who makes decisions, the members of that governance group, and this all fluctuates, is different depending on the size or the content of a shared service. So if it's large, if you're completely consolidating, then you're going to have a much larger scope. If you're doing a certain project together, maybe with a shared procurement, then your, your, um, your processes, you may have less and a smaller scope. So as uh, I was reading all 34 shared service um, applications, proposals, I had the opportunity to be with the county IT directors. So I put together a little survey for them and discussion to ask them what they thought. So 39 counties were attending the conference and 25 counties completed this service, uh, this, our survey on shared services. So my first question was, how involved were you in the development of your county's shared service plan? And this is what emerged. So eight said not at all. Nobody contacted them um, or even talked to them. Somewhat involved, I probably should have broken that out into a couple of different categories because it ranged from people saying, I showed up at a public meeting and I forced my way in to somewhat involved, I got a list of questions in email from our county administrator asking us to fill them out to inform the plan. We got three very involved and we got one um, extremely involved. If you wanna know who the one is, I'll tell you after. So then we said, do you have any opinions about shared services in your county? Um, and I just selected a couple of comments, more on the, some on the pro, some on the con. So we've been doing shared services for over a decade. And I will tell you that that comment comes from a county that did not submit a shared service plan. In fact, they didn't write a little. They wrote the front and back of two pages of all the shared services that they're doing. Um, Shared services is a general mode of operation, and we want to do it. On the con side, they were saying it's important to do, but we won't be able to do it if we don't have the necessary resources. It's a good idea. Um, and constant battle with supervisors on past shared services efforts cloud future enthusiasm. Does any shared service not require IT? This is where the debate came in. Some said, no, there's some, there's some things that don't have IT, but then they got into talking about all of the infrastructure that they have to manage. And yes, there could be shared service efforts that don't need IT, but it depends on what county does. And most of it is embedded mostly as that enabler. We set out some challenges to shared services that we all know, and then we asked them to add their own. Here's what emerged. The number one was the power struggle in acquiring and maintaining resources for the shared service. Really not a surprise. We all knew this was going to, to come up. What, what um, the one that was the first added challenge is pay discrepancies and benefits for the same title uh, when there was a merger. That was a county that came up after and said, this was a deal breaker for us. All these other ones were annoying. We got through them, we figured it out. That challenge was a deal breaker in our shared service. So if you can pass along that message to anyone, that's what um, he asked me to do. So when we were reading the, the plans, we didn't see a lot of cybersecurity. Maybe it's embedded, maybe it was within the thought process, but this creates new opportunities for data breaches. Um, and we know that there was a, a recent data breach out in Western New York where they weren't so much looking for the data they were looking to go in and create accounts, which they did, create 10 administrative accounts to use the financial um, procurement of the small village to buy things online. So these new models create a different way of thinking about cybersecurity, and we'd like to see more of that and have more discussion about that in the plans. So I'm gonna leave you, I think, 
with this. I don't know if I have a slide after this. Um, discussion of increasing complexity. If you look down in the green, you have one department who's trying to accomplish one goal. What do they have to reconcile as far as processes, rules, policies, systems, data? They probably have singular of all of those. As you move and want to uh, have more shared within an organization across departments, then you have different processes. You have different people weighing in. Once you move out of the organization and you cross jurisdictions, that's where the complexity increases. And that's where we, CTG, do a lot of work in helping think about what that complexity is so we can forge a path forward. So I thank you, and uh, I appreciate the time. We're uh, pushing the schedule a little bit here because we started late, and this is a heavy, a large panel. Um, we have somebody with a microphone. Does anybody have questions? We'd like you to, in the back. Um, I really have a comment about the report and, and the program as I read it through the report. Um, as I looked at the report, uh, there were a lot of very useful observations about the process and uh, what you found. But uh, as I read it, uh, it, it looks to me like the, the way the process is designed, that there was a great deal of focus on thinking about how we can do things better. And that's important. How, uh, you need to think about policy. You need to think about how you approach uh, processes. What I don't see is a very good emphasis on evaluation. And so when I looked at the report, um, there, there's a lot of descriptive information about the fact that some counties did a good job of providing information about the costs and benefits of what they were doing, and others didn't. But then I look at the wrapper that, uh, that's here, and I see some very unqualified claims of benefits. Um, for example, that uh, the program has yielded taxpayer savings. It would be more proper to say that the Participants claim that the program could yield taxpayer savings in the future um, because we don't really know what benefits are going to accrue until we have a better evaluation, and we just don't have that yet. So I'm, I'm a little bit concerned in seeing two academic institutions, Rockefeller and the Benjamin Center, kind of offering something that makes the program look like it's done a lot more than it's actually done. So I think we need to be more careful about how we describe what's going on. I think um, the forms that the state used to um, describe that savings used that language. So we simply used the language that were in the forms that the state did. You're absolutely correct. And I think the report does say that there are definitely questions about whether those savings can be met. Uh, but the form that you submitted with your plan did not have projected. It had taxpayer savings. That's why we classified it as that, because that's how the plans classified it. But, John, you're absolutely correct that um, those are expected savings or projected savings, not actual. Let's, I'll take another question or two. I, I'm Mildred Warner from Cornell. I would just, um, um, I appreciated the thoughtfulness of your presentation, and you point out that of the $208 million in projected savings, after you take out um, the, 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 the first five counties, then in the other 29 counties, we only find $20 million in projected savings. So that's less than a million per county. And then when you describe the projects, you describe insurance, um, EMS, energy procurement, a, a lot of back office stuff, and then you move to IT and the importance of this. When we did our 2013 survey of local governments and shared services, we found that they said they were most likely to find cost savings in back office stuff. That's the only place where you find economies of scale. Um, the international research on shared services shows that cost savings is found less than half the time. And the reason for doing it is for improving services, 
um, having regional coordination, um, taking on new technologies that bring a better quality service. And so I think we need to be careful as we move forward in how much we expect savings as opposed to improvements in service quality which improve the quality of life of our citizens and the effectiveness of our government. And so I, I think what's, what's really interesting is you were very clear to say that of that 208 million, you know, 10% of that savings is what we're seeing as we move across the board. And I think as you go into that and you actually track what people find, you may find that you don't get a cost savings at all, but you get a service improvement. And what is it that we're about in local government? Is it just cost savings or is it service improvement? Mm -hmm. Another question. Or do we have a question? Uh, yeah, no questions. I haven't asked. heard a question yet. <laughs> Steve? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see anything, um, Tom, in the report on the, one of the special districts, um, uh, fire districts. And uh, I thought that was a missed opportunity to include, I uh, appreciate the reference to the school districts um, on a go forward basis, but fire certainly, uh, there are many of them out there and often, I don't know how long we can sustain volunteer fire individual districts going on a go forward basis. The law did not excluded provide, fire districts. Yeah. yeah, the law did not allow fire districts to participate. I know that, but on a yeah. go-forward basis. For oh, that's a good point. Yes, absolutely. Well, we see a, we do. Yeah, I think you're right. We see a lot of interest in that, uh, and uh, you know, there's it, it's I think is a perfect example of the dichotomy between some of the images about you know uh, turf. Uh, and uh, tr and consolidation because what we see from the fire district folks we're talking to who are very very committed people uh, is that they're all uh, they're all on mutual aid to every district anywhere near them <laughs> so they're doing a lot of stuff uh, they're very worried uh, they think you know I talked to some people in Chautauqua County who said you know when somebody dials nine one one they expect somebody's going to come. And they're worried that people won't show up because they don't have enough people. Uh, and of course, Chautauqua County goes from very small populations to very big populations in the summer. So it's a it's a it's a really complicated problem. So we do think that there are uh, there's a lot of interest in shared services by the fire. Again, innovation is going to have to come from the ground up. Uh, so we see a lot of that interest, and we are working with fire districts uh, on that, and uh, would hope that we could find ways to do it. Again, that one is going to be particularly challenging because all of our programs are basically uh, hardwired around savings. And in that case, you know, a lot of times those things, savings are going to be hard to come by because you might move it to... It itself might be, what Mildred was saying about service improvements in our community. Right. Being right. able to provide the service improvements. Sure, sure. And so, of course, of course that gives, again, avoided costs is a way to sort of partly calculate that. So our programs, again, aren't uh, exactly well suited for that, but we are, do see a lot of that, and we're trying to work with that. In the last round of uh, LGE uh, uh, programs, we specifically identified uh, countywide EMS, another place where there's uh, difficulties there, uh, allow the secretary to award points for programs of regional significance, which would sort of take away some of the uh, shared savings deficit and move it into a fundable grant. So those are all things that are certainly. All right. Our second uh, panel today is uh, municipal responses to the New York tax cap. We're going to start off with um, Austin Aldeg from Cornell University is going to be talking about overriding the property tax cap, who, where, and why. And then Kevin Bronner from the University of Albany is going to be talking about New York's property tax cap and the county bond rating. Thanks. Austin, thank you. Good. It's the presentation. Oh, do I just hit the next? Oh, okay. You know. <laughs> Great. So, um, good morning. My name is Austin Aldag. I am a current second year master's student in planning at Cornell University. Before I get started, we handed out a couple of these and put them at some of the tables. We're actually holding a local government fiscal stress event on our campus on December 1st. We have a couple people coming in from Michigan, a couple people coming in from Wisconsin, just talking about local government challenges more broadly. Um, uh, you can RSVP, it's free. Just please tell us if you're coming so we can organize.
organized food. So there's my shameless plug for a little event we're having. Um, we're really happy to be here. Thank you for the, to the Rockefeller Institute and NightSAC for sponsoring today's event. Um, today, my job is to kind of share and give you a little teaser on some uh, research Professor Warner, Professor Yunji Kim and I have been working on, looking at the property tax cap in New York State, asking three basic questions. Uh, who overrode the property tax cap? Where are they located spatially on a map? And why did jurisdictions override or why did they not override? So those are kind of the three basic questions we're trying to answer in this research. Um, it, I usually don't talk to a room of um, local government experts, so it should go as no surprise that local, local governments in New York State are facing um, great budgetary pressure. While the uh, most recent Comptroller report, I think, indicated 40 municipalities under a stress category, um, we asked respondents um, to rate their own level of fiscal stress on a four-point scale. We found that over, um, or roughly about 50% of respondents indicated their fiscal stress situation as either weak or, or moderate or significant. Um, so that's a big change from the Comptroller report. Um, the Comptroller report only measures budgetary um, obligations and budgetary line items, but I think we should think about fiscal stress and budgetary insolvency and everything in a much more broader framework, um, including things like service obligations, citizen needs, quality of service, um, and future development and planning of our um, local governments. So with that being said, um, all the research that I'm going to be presenting today is based on our most recent survey. Um, it went out to all local governments in March and April of this year. We're really excited about our response rate um, shown on the map. Um, we have a pretty good geographic balance to the data set, and we had about a 58% response rate of all um, local governments in New York State. Um, and that's just a quick breakdown by um, government type. We want to thank our two partners for this study real quick, um, the New York Conference of Mayors and the New York State Associations of Towns. Um, and we also have a descriptive report that I can send to anybody that's interested, and we have a few printouts that catalogs the whole survey, survey in its entirety. Um, so let me know if you want a copy of that. Um, so on the survey, um, we wanted to get to the drivers of fiscal stress in New York State, so we asked respondents, um, what drives your fiscal stress situation? We found that most of these obviously um, derive a lot from state-level policy. The top three were stagnant state aid, state mandates, and the property tax cap, which I'll go a little bit more in later. But that's not the whole problem, obviously. There's stress with pension co or personnel costs and benefits and aging infrastructure. Um, cities identified stress most acutely in pensions, benefits, and poverty, and counties emphasize state mandates um, more so than any other local government. Um, so getting a little bit more clear on the property tax cap, 86% of respondents to our survey said it was either a moderate or significant driver of fiscal stress. So given that s stress is high more generally around the state, and given more in particular this is a driver of fiscal stress, we wanted to look into the public decision to actually override the property tax cap and kind of figure out who's doing it, where's doing it, and why or why not. Um, so just a quick how-to guide. Um, to override the cap, you need a 60% supermajority of voting power on the governing board. Um, this is very different than other states that have very similar um, tax and expenditure limitations, and this is different for school districts in the New York State. Um, after that, you have to pass a budget and have it approved by the state um, secretary of state. So getting a little bit more into the fun data of our survey, we can actually look at actually who overrode the tax cap in New York State. Our survey asked in the last three years, has your jurisdiction overridden the tax cap? Overall, only about a third of respondents indicated that they did. Um, this is lower than studies in other states such as California, Colorado, and Massachusetts. We think this um, lower propensity to override is due to how long the tax cap has actually been in place. Um, California's tax cap, which is Proposition 13, was passed in 78. Um, and Cal uh, Colorado has something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which was passed in 1992. Um, so now that the tax cap was passed in 2011, implemented in 2012, we are only seeing about a third of jurisdictions overriding the tax cap. Um, by government type, counties and cities were more likely than towns and villages to override the cap. So if we look at a quick, cool map that I made, um, we can look at where the tax caps are happening in the state. These indicate that, that these jurisdictions overrode the cap. So that's um, what's actually outlined. And what's outlined in red is the New York City um, Metropolitan Statistical Area that the Census Bureau puts together. Um, so we can look at where overrides are happening. Again, we're seeing that the, there's a higher propensity of overriding the tax cap in the hinterlands of the upstate. New York region um, when compared to um, the suburban fringe or the counties um, surrounding New York City. Um, in terms of these two very different geographical areas, there's a lot of 
differences we should keep in mind when we're thinking about why a jurisdiction might override the property tax cap. Um, upstate municipalities are not only more fiscally stressed, they're less property tax dependent, they have a higher amount of property tax, or a lower amount of property tax per capita, and they also have a higher amount of tax exempt property as a part of their tax base. So meaning we're, start, we, we're kind of playing with the idea of there's an emergence of two different New Yorks in terms of pushing back on state austerity and overriding the property tax cap. So lastly, here's to the why or why not question. On our survey, we asked why did your jurisdiction override the tax caps for ones that indicated they did or why they didn't. For the 330 municipalities that did override the tax cap, they did so to maintain services. So at 72% indicated that was their motivating factor or to cover the increasing cost of employee benefits, 60%. 40% indicated they did so to maintain long-term capital investments. Um, and then the last one, a third, roughly a third said there was an uncertainty in budgetary um, projections or the actual calculation that the comptroller does to set their levy limit. In terms of not overriding the tax cap, local governments are saying they don't need to. 60% um, said it was just unnecessary, they didn't override it. Um, followed that is for residents to qualify for the tax freeze rebate program that rewards citizens that live within um, local, local governments that did not override the cap. Here's a quick breakdown of by city. I can, say, I can send these slides to everybody, so don't like try to look at all the numbers. Um, we broke it down by government type and then by the region type again, like what I was talking about earlier. Um, counties did, or let me see. Here's a quick yeah, breakdown of why you overrode the cap. Um, we can see that cities um, in the highest propensity was cities to maintain services. Um, covering increasing costs of employee benefits was highest in towns and then followed by villages. Um, and then when we break it out into the upstate and New York City metro suburban region, we see that there's actually a statistical significance um, difference between the motivating factors of overriding the tax cap. In terms of, um, these are in terms of long-term capital investments and uncertainty in budget projections. Um, upstate is more worried about maintaining long-term capital investments and New York City metro regions were also less likely to have um, uncertainty in budget projections. So here's that same breakdown, but with the questions of to why not overriding the tax cap. Counties did not override because it was unnecessary. They were the highest rating in that um, in that answer, voter opposition was indicated most by cities and fear of straight state retribution was indicated most by villages. Um, yet again, there's a, a statistically significant difference when you look at it by the upstate downstate um, divide. Um, and these are in terms of voter opposition and fear of state retribution. Um, the New York City Metro, so the jurisdictions that are within the Metro region indicated that they had more voter opposition to overriding the property tax cap. And then, but, at the same time, upstate municipalities said that they had a higher fear of state retribution. So bringing this all together, now we're, in the, um, we're working through a couple statistical models that are trying to fit um, the decision to override. So we're doing a logistic regression model, um, looking at the motivating factors um, and then these constructs, talking about demography, politics, capacity, geography, fiscal stress, um, infrastructure cuts, economic growth, and budget and tax base structure. So here's some model results. Um, these are model or variables that relate to overriding the tax cap to a higher degree. Here we see if you're more fiscally stressed, both in terms of our measure of fiscal stress and in terms of the comptroller's measure of fiscal stress, you're more likely to override the tax cap. Um, we also asked on our survey of um, a variety of attitudinal questions of governing boards and, constitu and um, their constituents. Of this, we asked if they believed the governor's narrative that local government inefficiency leads to high property taxes. If the government believed it did, or wanted to push back against that narrative, they were more likely to override and push back. Um, we also see that more tax exempt land within a jurisdiction is leading to more overrides. Percent of the budget that is um, employee costs is also leading to more tax um, or property tax cap overrides. Um, cutbacks made in road repair is another variable that was um, significant and leads to more tax cap overrides. And lastly, um, total services provided. If a municipality provides more services, they're more likely to override. That kind of goes with the motivating factor of they did so, or 72% they said they did so to uh, maintain services for their residents. Here's the same results, but just looking at what is le uh, leads to less overrides. Um, geography matters. Um, if you were located in the New York City metropolitan region, you were less likely to override the property tax cap. 
Um, if you're growing in terms of employment and jobs, you are also less likely, um, which might go with the motivating factor of it was 60% uh, saying they did not motivate or they were not motivated to override the tax cap because they simply did not need to. Um, we're also seeing the result that governmental attitudes as believing the governor's narrative that of um, local government inefficiency, if governments were more likely to believe that, they're also less likely to override the property tax cap. Um, similarly, if they submitted or were a part of the, gov or the government efficiency plan that we were talking about earlier, if they were a part of that and they submitted one, they're also less likely to override the property tax cap. And lastly, as um, the percentage of the I took a percent of property tax revenue over total assessed value as a proxy measure of kind of taxing effort. If you had a higher degree of that, you were actually less likely to override the property tax cap. Um, so in, in conclusion, again, we're, tr we're starting to see an emergence of two different New Yorks in terms of overriding the property tax cap. This could be upstate versus the New York City suburban fringe, believing the governor's narrative and submitting a general efficiency plan versus um, wanting to push back and not believing the narrative. Lastly, um, also growing economies in terms of jobs and then ones that are under fiscal stress. And the tax cap does not fully consider the structure of the tax base, which gets a little bit with talking about tax exempt land, um, cuts in road repair, cuts in budget, and they don't take into consideration the budgetary structure of employee benefits as a percent of total local expenditures. So that's all I got. Again, um, I can send this report out to everybody. Um, that was kind of a really quick overview of what we're doing. Um, and I look forward to your questions and further informing this research as it moves forward. Thank you. Oh, you just, you just click through it. Okay, I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me today. My talk is, a, it's not, I'm really not getting into the merits of the property tax cap. In, in this presentation. But what I'm interested in, I've studied the tax cap for several years. Uh, yeah, I've studied the uh, tax cap for uh, several years. And when I started looking at it, you know, I, I came to the conclusion, well, other states had, most other big states had a tax cap, but we didn't until 2011. And then I researched uh, a lot of information on the tax cap, and I'd see a lot of people were against the tax cap, other people were for it. And as I was doing that, I, came, I said, well, what happened to the bond ratings? And I did this mainly for the counties, because I wanted to cover most of the geography in the state. So I decided to do a study of bond ratings from 2010 to the early 2017 to see if this tax cap was really that severe, I would have expected some kind of bond rating activity that would tell us that. So that was the basic idea here. Okay, and I think we all know pretty much about the uh, property tax cap, but some of my conclusions, you know, you still need a balanced budget if you're in a local government. And then I, I put a, a point in here, the cap is not mandatory to any degree. I don't understand why you could say it's mandatory to any degree. We just had a presentation where a lot of people overrode it. Uh, there, there's some elements of it, you know, there's property tax refunds, and there could be some political pressure, that, that could happen, but then there's several special exclusions. And some of them, you know, pension systems, growth in the tax base, there's a carry forward computation, court order related expenditures, school district capital expenditures. These are just some of the exclusions. So there's a lot of exclusions. So when you're thinking 2%, it's often not, doesn't have to be 2%. And just uh, around this area here, I'm from Albany, so I pay attention to this really closely. Now, the city of Troy had a large 2017 tax increase to help fix a budget gap. And I, I didn't see any major outcry about the city of Troy. They, they uh, had their tax increase and they moved on. Now, I happen to live in the town of Colony. I was on the town council in this uh, organization 10 years ago. And I was looking through their budget 
and you know, they, they claim that they're within the 1.84% tax factor for the uh, cap, or inflation factor. When you get into the internals in the budget, their property taxes are actually increasing by 3% because they, they can have tax uh, base growth. So these exclusions are really important in this. And they tend to indicate that the tax shouldn't have a major financial, the cap itself shouldn't be your major, major financial determinant. So this was the research question. Did the implementation of a new property tax cap in 2011 by the state of New York have a systematic negative effect on the general obligation bond ratings for county governments? I study other governments, but this presentation is geared towards counties. So, and I use Moody's for this. Uh, I think Moody's is really a, a trans, more transparent than Standard & Poor's. I mean, t 10 years ago, it was the other way around. Standard & Poor's was more transparent, but now I, I believe Moody's is. So, as I was studying the tax cap, I, I reviewed this paper that Moody's had from 2012, and it was about the tax cap. And they voiced concerns about the cap for low fund balance municipalities. And they had a whole list of governments in New York State. And then four of the county governments that were on that list were Broome, Monroe, Rockland, and Suffolk counties. So as I'm studying the bond ratings, you know, a lot of it, it was over a period of time. Uh, one of the big reports that Moody's has was from 2014 where they uh, discuss how they rate bonds. And they reviewed that in 2015 and 16 and issued a new report late in 2016. So these are the bond rating methodology reports that I considered when I did this. Now, when Moody's rates a bond, they have a metric scale that they talk about. So some of the items that are in it, there's a lot of items in it, but some of them are the tax base size, the full value per capita, the fund balance as a percentage of revenues, the five-year change, the cash balance, and five-year operating revenues uh, divided by operating expenses. So they study these and they come up with a score, and they have an indication that that can affect your bond rating. But then they say, well, we can look at other items too, such as if you, you lost a, a big uh, entity in your county that was generating revenue. Somebody, some factory moved away or a gaming interest, something like that. Now, I just put this slide in here. Bond buyer is a really important source of information about the municipal bond market. And I read it, and it, if you go through it, uh, the reports, I, I just put some examples in here. And they're really transparent in discussing this and what Moody's is doing. So there's a lot of information in the financial literature, financial market literature, about our tax cap. Okay, so this is what I did. I, I examined the bond rating changes from 2010 to 2017. I considered these white papers and other liter literature. There were about 41 counties that could be used in this study. So some counties don't have bond ratings, they may not use Moody's, or there may have been some kind of a data availability problem. But there were 41 counties that were rated in 2011 and in 2017. Okay, now if you look at what happened, the tax cap is frequently mentioned. So they'll say there's this tax cap in New York State, and the general obligation bond money is, can be affected by it. But if we look at the counties, what happened is 22 counties were upgraded, 13 were downgraded, six had no change. So 68% of the counties were upgraded or no change. So I, I would have rejected my research question that there was a systematic negative effect from the tax cap. So I did, did a little bit more work looking at the uh, counties that were upgraded or downgraded. And here's some of the ones that were downgraded. I, the ones that are underlined, I just underlined those because those were the four that were in the original Moody's paper, which I thought was interesting. Moody's, that, that's the 2012 paper. Moody's seemed to be on to these counties for some reason. But there was a lot of other counties that were downgraded during the period. 
Sometimes they mentioned the uh, property tax cap. Other times there's uh, individual issues associated with a county. And then I put in the bottom, this is just a l little question, is, is this a large county effect? Because you look at these counties that are downgraded, a lot of them are really big counties in the state. I don't know the answer to that, I haven't got that far yet. Then you look at the upgraded counties, it seems to be dominated by smaller counties. And there's a list of them there. There's some, uh, the last bullet I just put in some counties that are larger that, that got upgraded. But some of these are really small, you know, Allegheny County, Columbia County. But they're all subject to the tax cap, so they were upgraded. So then I, I took some controller's data and just looked at the property tax uh, percentage of revenues. For school districts, it's a lot higher, so this is a more severe uh, financial package for them to uh, work with. But if we look at all counties, it was about 23%. The upgraded counties, it was 23.8%. The downgraded counties, it was 20.6%. So this is telling me that you know, counties that downgraded relied less on the property tax on average. And then I, I just took some counties, how many of them were over 25%? That means they have more, pro more uh, property tax burden than the other counties. And if we looked at those counties, of those 20 counties, 50% of them were upgraded and only two were downgraded and a lot of them had no activity. So th this is a metric that you would expect that if the property tax was really affecting their bond ratings, the, the local governments with higher property tax uh, ratios would have uh, been downgraded worse. Okay. That's, it's a simple presentation. I can't systematically say that because of the property tax that uh, Moody's uh, downgraded the counties. Okay? So, questions? I just have two short uh, questions or thoughts. First for Mr. Aldag, and mostly these are useful, by the way. I think these are good presentations. Um, one thing I thought about when I heard your presentation was that you might want to think about, since personnel costs are very large drivers of municipal costs, um, instead of just looking at the level of personnel costs, whether you look at the, the rate of increase of, in, of personnel costs as a driver of the uh, issue of whether tax caps get exceeded. Because a lot of municipalities are locked into contracts, and, and um, but there are varying degrees to which they're affected as a result. Uh, so I think it might be worth looking at uh, the rate of increase. Uh, with respect to Dr. Bronner's uh, piece, one thing I did think about was that uh, fiscal stress is often related to the economic cycle. And so um, we, the last, the, the increase has really been relatively recent. I mean, the, I'm sorry, the cap has been relatively recent. And we're in a period where we've had relatively smooth sailing since the, the cap was imposed. But the question is, what happens the next time we have a crash? You know, how many municipalities are going to see, you know, their bond ratings, uh, you know, go down the tubes? How many are going to have to exceed the cap? Um, that seems to me a, a real question that we need to think about because I don't know that we're going to be in the same boat. Yeah, that's a good question. And I've thought of it. You know, the, the uh, interest rates are low now. They're supposed to go up next month. And then next year, they're supposed to go up a lot more. There could be a recession in the future. So I'll be studying that. You know, I had to study the period. I wanted to use the period we had because that's when the tax cap was implemented. So I, 2010 to 2017 was the study period. But I'd agree with you 100%. Well, I still follow this. You know, there's been a lot, a lot of activity this year on bond ratings for counties. Not a lot of big changes, but I'll be monitoring it. And as those interest rates go up, well, we can see if there's more uh, fiscal stress and downgradings. No, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we... So, uh, likewise, Dr. Brown, um one of the things I was curious about was uh, you report the, that there has been a change, but one of the things I was uh, curious to know is if you've uh, measured uh, from 
the, the levels. Were some of the places that were upgraded coming from a low rating to a, a, a somewhat better one? And was, for example, something like uh, Duchess or Rockland coming down from AAA to AA or something like that, just to get a sense as to whether or not the, the bottom was just sort of coming up a little bit and the top wasn't quite as good as it looked during the, the run-up to the financial crisis where ratings were It was all being AA to AA rated. Uh, really? Okay. There wasn't anyone who's really a C rated or anything like none of the counties are there. So it was a tight group of uh, bond ratings. Thank you. Hi, uh, David Kay from Cornell. Um, my, my knowledge of this started in California uh, after Proposition 13 was passed. And one of the things, for a number of reasons that are possibly different than in New York was it, it took quite a while in terms of years for the tax uh, limitations to really start biting hard. So it's related a little, so the question really to both of you really is like the, the importance of tracking this over time and to the extent to which you sort of think that what we've witnessed so far in terms of effects is projectable into the future very easily. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah, I, I think I would agree with you. Um, I think it's a cautionary tale what we're seeing thus far. And then when we look at states that have had these for many, many years, what their propensity of overriding the cap, or maybe the bond ratings are different there. But I definitely, because we're seeing that they're overriding the cap because of increasing costs that I think including a, a diff, like a change over time would be really interesting to look at. Um, but I think it's only going to get worse. So this is just kind of saying right now, what was the shock in the last couple years? But going into the future, I think tracking it is really important and seeing how it changes over time. And I, I'm waiting for the economic conditions to change, which was the subject of the question over here. So if, if interest rates, uh, you know, if that 10-year uh, Treasury bond goes up to 5 6%, I'll, I'll be really interested to see what happens here. If you look at the research on tax caps in other states, you'll see that um, in the end it doesn't have much of a suppression effect on, um, on expenditure because you have to find money to fund your services some way. But the, the issue may be particularly concerning for counties because they have less ability to charge user fees. And they're, they're relatively more dependent on both state aid, which tends not to increase when states impose tax and expenditure limitations, and they're more dependent on the property tax as a primary source of revenue. And so your the, the, the piece you're tracking on property tax dependence, keep an eye on that one over time, um, because places that are more property tax dependent are going to be more more constrained by uh, tax and expenditure limitation. That's what we're seeing when we look yeah, across the, the nation. Well, we're getting to another question. Austin, I, there was an item you had that I thought was related to not overriding, mm -hmm. or, or overriding, I can't remember which, which is the extent to which the person believed in the governor's logic regarding the tax cap. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we were on, a, on our most recent survey, we were trying to get, capture both at like the government level and the citizen level, that kind of a, a series of attitudes. So we asked things like, do you, does your governing board in your jurisdiction believe that um, government should share more with their neighbors, um, provide services, um, even in times of fiscal stress, provide economic development? And this was one of the questions in that attitudinal section of our survey. So the wording was, um, my, the governing board in my jurisdiction believes the governor's narrative of local government inefficiency. That's the one where it's like you're believing the narrative. And then the other one is my governing board believes we should push back on the governor's narrative. And we um, match that on a scale of one to five. And that's what, we, that's what we were trying to include in our model, trying to get at this like these two different New Yorks that believe the narrative or don't believe the narrative and want to push back, if that answers your question. And if they, if they believe the narrative, where did they tend to be on whether they exceeded or didn't? Uh, they don't exceed. They do not push back if they believe the governor's okay. narrative. All right. Other questions? Just a follow-up. Uh, Can we get you on the mic, please? So uh, your model, was this kind of a regression model? It was a logistic regression model. On one, they overrode the cap. Zero, they yeah. did not. So how strong were the coefficients? I mean, were, were these pretty strong, or were they They were pretty, um, I don't have the, I don't think I have the coefficients with me. I can send them. Um, they were pretty strong on the believe the governor's narrative, submit a GEP, um, and less strong on the, um, like, the economic growth variable, I think, if I'm remembering the coefficients right. 
Other questions? Kevin, I had, was wondering if you looked at the characteristics of the places that don't have uh, Moody's ratings. A lot of them seem to be uh, lo localities with data problems. So they tend to be smaller rural places? or be sm Yeah, small, the, the big counties all have the bond ratings. Okay, so they tend to be in the, the lower yes. size cohort of counties? There might have been some problem in reporting their uh, CAFR, their accounting report, items like that. Or they just don't, per you know, you have to pay to get a Moody's bond rating. Mm -hmm. Some people might just use standard and pours. And they may not want to use Moody's. I just was wondering if there's something systematic about what they look like. I didn't see any really systematic uh, result in that. All right. Any other questions? Oh, David. I always have questions if nobody else does. <laughs> Um, so I'm only modestly familiar with Moody's um, uh, rating systems. So I have a very basic question, which is how sensitive to something like a tax cap, particularly given all those qualifications that you put in in the beginning, how sensitive would you expect the, I mean, I understand the importance of the rating system for the municipalities and what they're rated as, but how sensitive would you expect it to be to something of this magnitude of change? Well, when I read the uh, 2012 paper that I cited there, I expected to, that them to be really, con you know, Moody's to be really concerned about the uh, bond ratings. And for the four counties that were listed there, those were the ones I underlined, they were downgraded. It wasn't necessarily because of the tax cap. So I, when I started looking at this, I really expected uh, to see more downgradings. But when you, I, I think Moody started to look at the cap and they saw all the loopholes in it and everything. And uh, the, they probably came to the, I can't speak for them. This is just my opinion from what I've read. I can't say, you know, exactly how they rated the bonds, but it seems the tax cap wasn't that un, important. But just to finish yeah. up, so they included all these other fundamentals in, the, you know, in, their, in their rating system. I mean, you would think that, I assume that there's an independent variable, which is the tax cap, which affects there wasn't it should be in the other indicators like your fund balance if the tax cap is affecting it and it's negatively driving it down I would have expected to see that but I didn't see that what they do with the tax cap they, they go through this big metric exercise but then they have what they call institutional values and they'll look at you know, these are kind of the, maybe they're the fudge factors that can be used, and they'll mention the tax cap in there. But I didn't see any evidence that anyone's uh, fund balance was driven down because of the tax cap. And I don't think it can be driven down because you have to have a balanced budget. Um, this afternoon we have, we're starting off with a panel on models and concepts to assist local decision makers and managers. Um, and we have two presentations in this session. Um, the first by David Kay from Cornell University. And I, the title he has up there is better than the one we included in the agenda, which is the Academy and Local Policymakers Approaching, approaching Controversial Topics. And then uh, Susan DeVinter from the Office of the New York State Comptroller is gonna talk to us about um, it takes a village and a state and a federal government um, intergovernmental roles in monitoring and managing infrastructure. So David, I'm gonna start us off. Thanks, Mike. I'm gonna interpret the silence as that you're all exceptionally attentive as opposed to the fact that some people like to have siestas after lunch. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try and go through a fair amount of material quickly. I had forgotten that I changed the title. Sorry about that, Mike. Um, this is about an applied research project that I should go back one that my colleague uh, Robin Blakely Armitage and I have been involved in. It's a, a very small project in terms of the amount of resources we have to work with, but the good thing about it is, is it lasts for a number of years. So we've been able to, we're about, into the second year of this project now and are hoping to have a few more years to be able to uh, push it forward. So this really is in progress work. Um, 
The formal name of the project that we're working on is University Community Intermediaries Supporting Informed Decision Making in a Polarized Context. It, there's funding from the USDA under Hatch funding, Hatch Act funding, and the focus is on relationships, paths of influence between the academic community and local policymakers. So actually as a start off, I'd just like to get a sense in the room. How many of you are primarily on the research side of things? A few, and then people with state or local government? Most, anybody else I'm missing? <laughs> Already met Joe, where do you put yourself? State or local government. Okay, there you go. Um, so we have a whole bunch of questions, but really the fundamental one is how are university-based, and we could even make it broader than that, but how is sort of scientific and technical and information that comes from research, but we're saying how are university-based information, research, outreach, and community engagement efforts viewed, accessed, interpreted, and used by decision makers dealing with pressing complex and often controversial issues. So right from the beginning, you can see we're not looking at ordinary run of the mill decision making on the assumption that in some of your communities, at least not everything is heavily uh, linked to controversy. We're kind of focusing on the, I think somebody threw up a version of the 80-20 rule earlier, the ones that take 80% of the time uh, in, in a lot of uh, governmental processes. Um, I'm going to just start with a little bit of really general context based on some survey data um, uh, about governance in general in the United States and some specific things about local government. The specific thing here, I think we all know, uh, the trust in the institutions in general on the part of the public who employ and uh, the very formal way of voting for you, for you in government, they're your employers. Uh, Trust in, in people in institutions in general has declined. Um, Mike and I over the years did some work looking at trust in local government versus trust in federal and state government. I'm not going to go into that now, but here's one, here's one uh, thing about higher education. So the first chart on the left is about decline in trust. And if you went back to the 60s and 70s, which that chart, which you can't see, doesn't do, it would be a steeper decline even. But trust in institutions in general has been uh, low and getting lower. There's a small uptick for 2017 in this data. Tr uh, trust in institutions of higher education is more or less follows that chart. About 14% of the US public reports a great deal of confidence in higher education. Um, the other numbers are about 30, around 30, 20 to 30% up there, but that includes uh, some confidence with great deal of confidence. So. You can make your own judgments about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or high or low, but uh, I would say it represents a problem. I'm going to give you a few uh, results from a recent, uh, two, well, it was 2016, so not super recent, uh, National Survey of Public Opinion again that Cornell does every year. Um, how well informed do you think that your local rather than your state or federal government officials are about local issues? Think about it and then I'll show you the answer. But I want you to think first so you have an expectation to see whether it's confirmed or not. Pretty high level of, if you look at the blue, 23% extremely well informed, 56% somewhat well. So, you know, I would say not bad. They think we're well informed. Now we ask a question, how much of the time can you tr trust your local government's decisions when issues are controversial? Now that's probably gonna depend on whether they like the people in office or not, right? <laughs> um, but uh, significant, again, just about always, most of the time, some of the time, almost never or never. So significantly less, I mean, take this for what it is. Um, I'm not going to overinterpret or dwell on it, but the question we really wanted to ask was the following one. When local, official, well, local elected officials in your community make decisions about controversial issues, what should influence their decisions the most? Popular opinion or expert opinion? Any guesses what the response to this one's going to look like? 50-50? 
Any other takers? We have a 50-50 going once, going twice? 75% popular. 75% popular, okay. I think you're gonna get the prize because most people want both equally and there's equal numbers that want smaller numbers that want popular and expert opinion. This was, unlike you, this is not what I expected. I was expecting more what you were saying. So, um, Again, this is national data. Um, so all that's kind of, oh, and then I have a little thing that comes in that you can't read, but. <laughs> um, so that's just kind of the general background, sort of empirical context of the world we're in and one of the reasons we're interested in it. We started looking through literature of, that relates to the topic, specifically about engagement of the academic community with local officials. And what did we find? Not much. Um, really very, very little uh, that sort of narrowed in on that way. But there was a lot of background work that we did find that was relevant to the question, even if it wasn't focused on the question. And I'm gonna show you some of these. I mean, so the paradox of policy analysis. It's, if it's not used, why do we produce so much of it? For all you researchers here, why, 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 why? Um, and assumes that it's not used. Well, that may or may not be true. And then a lot of work about rationality and models of rationality in both economics and politics. You know, are decision makers rational? If so, how do you define rationality? Um, there's some good stuff out there. This is some of the, work that I personally have drawn on from my, uh, from my background to bring to bear on this, including some work that, some popular work, I guess this doesn't really show up there, behavioral economics, conflict management, um, uh, work on federalism, and I won't tell you what terror management theory is about, but you can come talk to me about it afterwards if you're really interested. <laughs> uh, it's a psych, and some psychology. Um, but then there are two uh, pieces of work I'll just spend a few minutes talking about a little more. One of them is uh, really social psychology, and this is the, uh, a partner in our project, um, Dan Kahn at uh, Yale University runs a cultural cognition project. And then another uh, bit is uh, political science, it's been fair, uh, theory of political science has been fairly influential. Um, and, um, and by the way, I should, full disclosure, I'm trained as an economist, but I'm in a sociology department. I work mostly with planners, so I'm kind of very broad and shallow in terms of what I know about things. <laughs> but I like to synthesize and draw on information from a lot of places. Um, so Dan's work is, his goal is what he calls protecting the science communication environment. Like how do we actually create contexts in which people listen to science is what he's work, he works on. Um, and he's particularly interested in the idea of, and the phenomenon of ideologically motivated cognition. So this is where interests in forming and maintaining beliefs that signify their loyalty to affinity groups become very important. And for affinity groups, for shorthand, you can, it's not really what he looks at, but it kind of it correlates pretty highly with where you are in the political spectrum. Identity politics is another kind of way of, of framing that shortly. So what he, uh, so he starts with empirical observations and then develops a theory around it. The empirical observation that he talks about is uh, sort of the standard information deficit science comprehension thesis is that it's when people learn more about the facts, they come to understand the facts in the ways that uh, there tends to be more consensus. And at the bottom, you can't really see it, the bottom says science literacy, numeracy. So that's essentially how good are people at processing information. So the farther to the right you are, the better you are in general on standardized tests of processing information. And then, there, if you want to think of it in sort of political terms, which might be a little easier, the green line is the, uh, is the liberal democratic side and the blue line is the conservative uh, side. Um, and it doesn't really matter exactly 
where those lines are for what he's talking about. What matters is what happens to those lines. So science, the science uh, comprehension thesis would say, wherever people start, the more they learn about something, the more they tend to converge towards a common understanding of what, doesn't mean they're gonna converge on policy, but they tend to converge on a common understanding of what's going on. Um, his cultural cognition thesis finds many, but a minority of circumstances where the exact opposite happens. The more educated, the better people are at processing information, the more their understanding diverges. This particular one happens to be about climate change, which we know is a pretty polarized. So the, the point of this is to, to kind of show that there, I'm not gonna read all of these or say what they are, but there's a bunch of issues on the left where attitudes tend to stay together or converge, and there are a bunch of other kinds of issues where they uh, tend to diverge. And we're particularly interested in our work on what, how do we prevent the divergence from happening when people stop processing information on the basis of the information that's presented and instead process it in terms of their affinities or cultural identities. You're gonna keep me on track time-wise, Mike. Um, so one of the things that that's led us to do is to say one of the things that's very important in approaching our work as educators is to identify the nature of the issue. And by the way, it's not the issue per se that makes it polarizing or not, it's the context in which it's being discussed. So an issue in one part of the country may or may not be uh, in one of these categories, whereas in another uh, part of the country it might be very different. And you'll see that in terms of a lot of survey data that that sort of pattern of polarization, for example, around GMOs, gen genetically modified organ organisms, not at, in, within the general population, it doesn't show the divergence pattern in the United States, at least not yet, even though it's very controversial, it does show that pattern in Europe. Um, so we're just here, I'm not gonna read all this, but just saying there's technically com complex issues, there are controversial issues, and then there are these culturally polarized issues. And we're saying, hey, as an educator, as a, somebody dealing with these issues, it makes sense to understand which type you are talking about. Uh, the second uh, piece is uh, the political science. And one of the reasons we were attracted to this is because it really focuses on policy change and learning a lot of, uh, so there's some evolution in how people think about things that's built into this theory. Um, the main thing, there's a bunch of exogenous things on the left of this, left part of this chart, and then there's a policy subsystem. What this guy is writing about is advocacy coalitions where people are sort of on different sides of an issue or contesting with each other to influence policy. And the key thing for us, what we probably can't read it, right at the very top there is, policy brokers, people who have inter intervened close to what we call in our work intermediaries, and that's kind of the place where higher education has the most likely uh, opportunity in this model to intervene. Um, key thing about this theory is that, not too surprising, it's kind of common sense in some ways, but people have core beliefs, subsidiary beliefs, and it's much harder to change people's core beliefs than it is to change their uh, subsidiary or secondary belief system. So if you're trying to deal with the basic, basic values, basic belief systems about what taxation, for example, good or bad thing, um, it's gonna be hard if you're trying to deal, uh, deal with educating around those issues and people will reject information that contradicts their pro previously held beliefs. So, which is really what this says. So again, our work has been primarily focused on the role of intermediaries, how can people like university folks uh, intervene in these kinds of contexts around controversial issues and hope to make a difference? Um, so one of the things we've done is we've interviewed a lot of our educators across the country who work in this, uh, in this arena to find out what kinds of roles they actually take on in their work. So on the right-hand side of this chart, that's kind of a policy cycle, a version of a policy cycle in the middle, showing that you know policies go through cycles. I'm not gonna go into all the parts of the cycle, but 
This is a very traditional thing that, that academics tend to do, and bring unbiased information together, write papers, search for funding, maybe do evaluations, some case study work, um, presenting information. There's more people uh, towards here who are also trying to offer advice and guidance uh, that, that may involve more interaction. Some of our colleagues are working more uh, in different parts of the poly cycle on communication skills, on information use and interpretation, sort of more at the basic skill level, I would say, rather than information delivery stage. Moving on over to the left, more and more about process. Uh, facilitation, negotiation, building relationships of trust and credibility, assessing situations, acting as neutrals, etc. Conveners. So you can look at a spectrum really from the right side, information delivery. On the left side, it's more about creating what I think of as creating context under which learning can happen before you present the information. Um, I just like the title of this paper, Researchers are from Mars, Policymakers are from Venus. Uh, one, of the, you know, one of the problems in terms of, even with information conveyance, is uh, the problem that I'm guessing most of you are familiar with about how uh, there's too much information out there and actually making sense of it and having the time to sort through it is a huge problem for people in policy positions. Uh, a lot of kind of good common sense uh, advice for policymakers about things to pay attention to when they're presenting information, which most of us are very bad at, including me, because I'm running up against my time limit right here. <laughs> uh, uh, the point of this is not to show you all of these, but, but each one of these squares is talking about some kind of issue or hindrance that arises in uh, in, uh, in an interaction with policymakers, and that they're, for each one of these problems, people dislike uncertainty, there's a different approach to dealing with that. So you have to be pretty sensitive to what people, uh, how they're responding to you, if you wanna actually communicate with them and try and get around, and this is for human beings as well, all of these affect human beings as well as policymakers, and then one is a subset of the other, of course, which means that policymakers can't escape their humanness when they're, when they're in these jobs. Um, and I think I'm gonna just skip this part, given the time, but we do have some programs. This is one of them that focuses, we partner with the, uh, with the American Farm Loan Trust, and this is just one of our attempts around the context of land use and agriculture and rural area programmatically to try and incorporate some of what we're learning as we go forward in our, in our project. And I'll stop at that. Is that all right, Mike? Thank you. I guess we can get you onto yours. Push that one to go. This one to go forward. Okay. Yep, there I am. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. So thank you for holding this forum again this year. I think it's a great way to bring together people from government and practitioners and the research community, and uh, it's always a very interesting discussion. So I'm very um, happy that you invited us to participate. I'm gonna be talking about infrastructure today. Um, I'm gonna focus on bridges, dams, and school facilities in New York State um, because we recently released a, a project where we looked at bridges using the National Bridge Inventory data and we're planning to look at dams next. And I also wanted to talk about school facilities even though they're not currently on our research agenda because they're extremely interesting and I think the contrast with the way we manage bridges is quite interesting. Um, so, so for data sources, uh, for bridges, we have a lot of information on uh, bridges and school facilities in New York. So there's a national bridge inventory and it's available from the Federal Highway Administration. You can download information on all the highway bridges in the country. Um, and uh, for dams, 
There is also a national dam inventory that you can't download. The Army of Corps of Engineers has it, but I was able to get some data from the Department of Environmental Conservation, which regulates dams in New York State. And then for school facilities, New York is, has lots and lots of data, but it's not really very easy to access. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Every five years, the, um, all the school buildings in the state are inspected very, um, and there's a very elaborate data collection that um, takes place with that. So, so for, for bridges, we uh, recently published a little study that was very descriptive and it focused on local bridges in New York State. Um, so we, all the bridges in the state are, uh, gather, are inspected every two years or more often if it's warranted by their condition. Um, and DOT uses it to manage their bridge program. And a lot of the data is reported to the Federal Highway Administration where it becomes part of the National Bridge Inventory. And bridges also, the data includes a rating for each bridge. Um, we focused on local bridges. So um, half the highway bridges, more than half of the highway bridges in the state belong to local governments or authorities. Um, but they tend to be smaller, so if you weight them by the deck size, it's less than a third of the bridges. Um, and if you weight them by their average daily traffic, it's about 20%. Um, and this, I should notice that um, often in, at the controller's office in local government, we look at all the local governments except New York City, but this, the bridge data I have does include New York City, so we're also looking at New York City in here. And local bridges get a lot of traffic. They get uh, over 33 million uh, vehicles in average daily traffic. And we were able to compare, they get a rating of whether they're structurally deficient or not, or functionally obsolete. And uh, you can see that local bridges are more likely to be structurally deficient than state-owned bridges, but the gap is narrowing over the last you know, f uh, 14 years or so. Uh, state bridges have maintained steady where around 9% of them are structurally deficient, whereas local bridges have improved from 16.7 to 12.8. So who owns these local bridges? Uh, counties own two-thirds of them, and towns own another 16%, and then other types of local governments and authorities own the remainder. And the town bridges tend to, are more likely to be structurally deficient. So 18.4% of the town bridges are structurally deficient. And that's uh, compared to 12.8% overall. And the counties which have the most bridges, uh, for them, 11.6% are structurally deficient. And the data also includes cost estimates. The cost estimates they're for all bridges, not just structurally deficient. So um, every bridge gets has a costs associated with it in the data set. There are some caveats. The New York Department of uh, Transportation does the cost estimates for most of the bridges in the New York Bridge Inventory, but um, the, the the authorities do their own estimates. So it's kind of apples and oranges a little bit. And you also can't compare across states because every state has their own methodology. So um, the Federal Highway Administration, they also don't use the cost data themselves, so they don't verify it. So um, use it at your own risk, but we thought we would throw some out here. Um, so local bridges, 27.4 billion in estimated costs. But if you take out New York City, um, it's only 7 billion. So a lot of the costs are associated with New York City. So bridges are expensive. Um, so I looked a little bit about, tried to learn a little bit about how they're funded. It's a lot of federal programs, very complicated, but I got sort of a high level sense of how it generally works. Often uh, bridges are funded through federal matching programs if they're federally aidable, and often those are 80% federal funds and 20% uh, state local match. And those funds usually th flow through the state DOTs and that are very involved in administrating and um, kind of organizing, selecting projects. 
Um, but for urban areas with over 50,000 people, the federal law for federally funded um, transportation projects requires the use of metropolitan planning organizations, and those ensure that a range of stakeholders are at the table for the decision making, and it also provides some transparency in how those decisions get made. So, and then the state has funding for bridges a little bit. Um, the state has a five-year capital plan for transportation, and it has uh, federally funded and non-federally funded projects in it. Um, so, and that's available online. And also, um, there are some little pots of money for uh, local highway and bridge programs. So, one of them is the Consolidated Street and Highway Improvement Program, which is known as CHIPS. And that's kind of formula driven, and every um, local government that's eligible gets uh, an allocation, and then they can spend it on eligible projects as they, um, as they need to. And there's also a small pot of money, Marchicelli aid, that's used for the, uh, help, to help with the state local match to bring down federal funding. And those have, tend to be flat but sometimes there's a little extra money for chips. If there's a severe winter weather, there might be an extra budget appropriation to give them a little boost. There's also a state program called Bridge New York. Um, they've awarded an initial round of funding in January 2017. They announced 132 projects, totaling $200.4 million, and a lot of that was federally aidable projects for local bridges and culverts. And um, in the governor's press releases and things, it makes it sound like there's going to be um, a continuation of this, uh, this program in the future, but there aren't any appropriations for it, and it's kind of hard to f um, know what's exactly going to happen with it. So, so it's, it shows that bridges are on the state radar screen, but it's unclear exactly how it's all going to work. So takeaways for bridges, um, we know a lot about bridges. The federal government's very involved. They're involved because they have a strong strategic interest. Um, they want to promote interstate commerce. They are willing to help pony up uh, to make sure that uh, bridges, a bridge infrastructure is strong and able to meet the national interests. And we also have a lot of information on needs. The data is very good. It's very complete. It's got tons of detail, and that provides us with a rational basis for allocating resources. And we know that the needs are great, but they do appear to be manageable. So, so the bridge story is kind of like, wow, you can sort of stay on top of infrastructure, I think. <laughs> if you talk to the engineering groups, they're always giving out grades of you know D and C minus, and um, it makes it sound very, like the situation is quite uh, tenuous and we're in danger of losing all our bridges at any moment. But really there's a lot of machinery to monitor and keep track of stuff. So it, I think of it as a, as a good model, but it, it does take a tremendous amount of investment. But as we know, there's a lot of uncertainty around federal funding. <clears throat> there could be significant federal reforms. There's interest in um, privatizing public assets in many parts of the country, and increasing the use of public-private partnerships, and those are complicated and um, don't always work out to be such a good deal as people may think in the beginning. So, um, and the state budget is um, always, uh, this year in particular, there are, you know, the revenues are coming in lower than we expected, so there will be pressure on the state budget making. But overall, the story for Bridges is um, pretty optimistic. The story for dams is not, uh, we don't know as much about dams. There's, uh, the federal oversight is not as um, extensive uh, for dams that aren't owned by the federal government. In New York State, the Department of Environmental Conservation uh, oversees dams and they regulate dam safety. And they collect data and there is a uh, information on all the dams that DEC knows about, but it's not as complete as the bridge data. It's um, not the same level of investment in collecting the data, and it, 
It's just um, clearly they don't, they're not as, as rigorously overseen as, as was the case for Bridges. So I looked a little bit at the data on dams. There are over 7,000 in New York. Local governments own uh, many of them. Dams get a hazard classification. The no hazard and none assigned dams are really kind of de considered defunct dams, so you wouldn't even worry about them. And the ones that pose a risk really are the intermediate and high hazard dams, and those are the ones that get the most intense regulation. So local governments, uh, there's 1,034 high hazard and intermediate hazard dams in New York, and local governments own 400 of them. And a lot of the responsibility for dam safety falls upon the owners, not upon, you know, there's, DEC doesn't, isn't really responsible for the role. They can step in if there seems to be a problem and they can inspect mm -hmm. dams, but it's not systematic as it is for bridges. So, so for intermediate and high hazard dams, owners are supposed to have an emergency action plan. Uh, they are supposed to perform engineering assessments at least every 10 years, and they're supposed to certify with DEC their compliance with these provisions. So, yes, DEC can step in and evaluate or inspect dams and give them a, a condition rating, and they can order owners to repair or remove dams that are seen to be a problem, and if the owner fails to do so, then DEC can have the work done and charge the owner through a kind of a property tax lien sort of chargeback. So, so I looked at the certification data just to see, you know, how, how well applied are these, these um, how good is compliance with these kinds of uh, safety provisions. And Theoretically, if they're supposed to certify every year, this data came from the beginning of 2017. So I figure if they, if their last certification was before 2015, then they're probably not fully compliant. So 47% of the dams were not compliant of the high hazard, intermediate and high hazard dams. Um, the good news for local governments is that they seem to be more compliant than other types of owners. Um, funding for dams, there's not very much. Uh, there's a few federal programs with allocations, but they don't even seem to be fully funded. And as I said, DEC can charge owners if they have to make repairs, but there's not the same investment in just monitoring and overseeing it at DOT. There's a whole team that does structures and they do the inspections and they're, you know, we've dedicated state resources to that, but uh, the same is not true for dams at all. So for dams, we don't know as much. Limited federal role, state has oversight, but really it's up to the owners to make sure that uh, we have safe dams. On to school facilities. Here we have a ton of information. It's, uh, in New York anyways, it's mandated by state law that the, um, that districts report on their, every school building that's occupied by students or staff. Um, an elaborate survey, it's like 47 pages long, if you look at it as a PDF, and it covers everything. It covers major building systems, an overall condition rating, environmental factors like lighting and um, the adequacy of the classroom space, and, floor finishes, all kinds of stuff. Um, and they actually provide state aid to districts to help pay for the costs of the survey because it is um, pretty extensive. So I haven't, I play a little bit with the 2010, it was done in 2010 and 2015, and I really haven't, this isn't really on our research agenda, but I have looked at it here and there, and we did put this chart in a report on school um, kind of education data generally. And my question on this data is, it's showing the percentage of low rated school buildings, the overall building rating, by ones that were unsatisfactory or poor. Most of them, hardly any buildings are poor, but many are unsatisfactory. 
but the improvement from 2010 to 2015 is really astonishing to me. And I want to know what's going on there. Like, is there a problem with the data? Uh, you know, I double check my numbers, but maybe there's some something on their end. And if not, what what caused them to go on a building spree, or you know, what? Like, what? What? <laughs> So I really want to get to the bottom of this, but I haven't been able to, and it's, I may not be able to, but I'm going to throw this out there as there's a lot of data on this, and somebody should look into it. So one place to look would be um, the, the building aid structure, the way building aid is um, given out. They do tweak it once in a while, the building aid formulas. Um, so building aid works by you have an allowable cost for your building project, and then you multiply that by the district's building aid ratio, and then that's how much building aid you will get for your, your project. The aid ratio is based on a district's relative ability to pay, which is uh, operationalized as a full property value per pupil compared to a state average. So that would be your theoretical building aid ratio. But in practice, you can use a previous one if it was more favorable. So very few districts use their current, what would be their building aid ratio today, because they can go back in time and find a better one and use that instead. So um, that can be a problem because it, it sort of makes buildings cheaper than they maybe should be. And so maybe they're building more than they should. Um, so in many districts, the state pays a huge share of the con school construction project costs. So that makes it cheaper for the local people, and then when they vote, they're thinking, well, the state's going to pay for most of it, so let's go for the swimming pool. Um, so we have a ton of data. We could learn a lot from it. Connecting the dots could be difficult. I did try to at least look at our financial data to see if I could see spikes in building construction. And the way building aid gets paid out, it gets paid out over an assumed amortization schedule. And yeah, it's just not easy to see in the financial data, but I think there's Got to be a way to figure it out. And one of the policy questions would be, do the funding mechanisms and decision-making processes over encourage overinvestment? I don't know. <laughs> so, but some considerations, policy considerations are um, around formula funding. It's hard to agree on what the goals of the funding formula should be in the first place. So you can have formula aid that's trying to do work at cross purposes sometimes. Formulas can be complex. Hardly anybody can understand them sometimes. So it's like inside baseball. Um, formulas can be frozen, like um, no, no longer reflect current conditions. An example would be aid and incentives to municipalities. That was used to, that was created based on a formula, but now everybody gets what they got, you know, for. I don't know how far back it goes, but like for the last 10 years, it hasn't changed. Um, it's hard to reduce formula aid once you give it to someone. It's hard to have a formula that um, where your aid can go down if your situation changes. They tend to want to save harmless, so everybody gets an increase or nobody loses. Um, and the recipients themselves sometimes would rather know what they're going to get for sure rather than have something that might might be higher and might be lower depending on how their circumstances change. So, so there are a lot of um, kind of political considerations that influence, that make it hard to use theory to drive funding, as I'm sure you, you all know. Also for school construction, voters get to weigh in on school budgets and school construction proposals. Um, and you, but you only get to have, vote on one thing at a time, right? So it's not like they say, would you rather have a bridge or a sewer system or a school? They're kind of like, hey, how about this new school? And you say, yes. Um, or if you say no, then they'll ask you again. <laughs> so, so they can revote. You get a second bite at the apple. So there again, I don't know, maybe we're, the deck is stacked in favor of lots of building for that kind of stuff. So uh, kind of for wrapping up here, I want to say that it's expensive to get good infrastructure data, but we do have some for certain, in certain selected areas, we have good data. 
And that data is extremely valuable and underutilized, I would argue. Um, and you can use it for trying to allocate limited resources effectively and ensuring public safety and offering technical support to local governments who need it. And also, you can use it to find out how effective your aid programs might be. And I would argue that we should make better use of the data that we have, especially the school building data, because it's amazing. And I don't think many people know it's out there. And it's not out there. You can download it from the State Education Department website as a big file, a bunch, a zip file of PDFs for every school building. So you get 4,000 PDF files that are 47 pages each, one for each school building. So you've coded all of that. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. but they do, they put it in an access database. So, uh, so people should, clamor for it, and I don't think they would refuse it because it's information that's out there publicly available, just not in a format that's so usable. So thank you very much. Any questions for Susan or David? Yes. Oh, we wait for our... Handy <laughs> microphone here. Um, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Uh, Van Deventer. Right. Okay, Very good. there we go. Um, going back to the, the mystery about the drastic improvement in school buildings mm -hmm. and so forth, I have no idea. Would you know if uh, such projects would have qualified as shovel ready projects under the federal stimulus? I think I asked State Ed about that like whether they thought it would be our money driving that. And they thought that that was before the time period I was looking at and that those projects would have already been done. But I was wondering about the, because there is a big lag between when you start building something and when you finish it and when you do the building survey. So, so I'm not, yeah, so, I'm one, so I wasn't totally mm. buying their answer, but that was the answer I got. And I haven't pursued that further than that. Um, I did ask that question, though, because that's what I thought. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> this is for David Kay. Um, you got kind of uh, foreshortened by uh, your time limits, so I'll just ask you uh, to offer maybe uh, one or two takeaways on the question of <clears throat> how research researchers can more effectively inform the policy process. Sure, uh, you know the. I think in in almost all cases like this, uh, but part of my message is going to be one overlying principle. It depends on the context, you know. So we, one thing I, you know, I was focusing on controversial topics, and uh, I can't. I personally came to this research from having done a lot of work on fracking, you know, starting in two thousand and eight, and sort of seeing how people responded to our information about that. Uh, which by a year or so into that issue, the only thing people wanted was information that supported their pre-existing positions, basically. Um, so, uh, so firstly, I would emphasize, particularly for intermediaries, you know, and amongst those I include many academics, but also staff to policy and you know institutes, places like this is. Developing, you know, making long-term investments rather than quick and dirty, sort of just get a paper out and hope that you can do that, but people are gonna, they're, they're gonna mine it in general for something to support what they already believe as opposed to trying to learn. So developing relationships of trust. Uh, the work that Dan uh, Kayan has done points in the direction and we're doing some experimentation with this idea of how do you, how do you present information which makes it at least harder to trigger, right from the get-go, identity kinds of signals. So, you know, there's, it's the use of language to some extent. I mean, you know, if you, there are certain kinds of issues that as soon as, like in fracking, like, I mean, people may not remember this, but if you spell that, F-A-R-C-I-N-G, as opposed to F-A-F-R-A-C-K-I-N-G, that would signal something about who you were and what your position came from. So. Like trying to be very sensitive to 
triggers that kind of tell someone right away which side you're on and which side they were on, <laughs> therefore. Um, so I don't think it's an easy thing to do, by the way. Um, but, uh, the program that I was putting up was, was one in which we try and get uh, mixes of people together, including policymakers, but also other stakeholders in a region around agriculture and land use and keep them together over a course of months, which is obviously pretty expensive, I mean, with five or six sessions, but you know, over a course of months and trying to really get people to develop relationships of trust with each other that wouldn't exist in different contexts. Uh, not easy, not cheap, and hard to scale up, but, and you know, in the context of the degree of pol polarization that we have in the country, uh, it seems like an important thing to explore how to do it better. So, can I ask a follow-up? Um, in the last, uh, your last key point, are you saying that there's evidence that if you can keep people together in a context other than the typical public meeting where you're having, where you're having some dialogue over the controversial issue, you think there's, you may have a better outcome? Yes. I mean, you know, one of the, there's a lot of work, for example, that's been done on uh, the dysfunctionalities inherent in the public hearing process. Which, which is a legally structured kind of process in which I've participated in many of. And for example, uh, John Nolan, around land use topics, John Nolan at Pace University, who we've collaborated with and his Land Use Leadership Alliance training people have spent years trying to help people understand that, yes, there are legal requirements that you have to go to and there's kind of an evidentiary proceeding, but there's a lot of other things you could do that are actually more conducive to actually information, receptivity, collaboration, in addition to the things that you're required to do legally. So, yes. Um, but again, they're all, they all require more effort. <laughs> Therefore, they're not easy and they're part of a culture of how decisions get made. And most people just want to do, because of time constraints or otherwise, let's just do what we have to do, understandably. Mm -hmm. We have some questions behind you there. Thanks. Um, this is a question for David Kay. Um, I just, this is just a clarification question. When you were showing the polarization um, and how some, in some instances, more education creates more polarization. What did you mean by more education? Do you mean like the right. people who were more educated in general uh, were more polarized on that topic, or did you mean the people, the more information they had received on the topic, the more polarized they were? Right, so most of the work, it's kind of both in general, but m the, w the better work, the work that Dan Can has done and some of the other stuff I put up there is based on, it's not more education per se, it's, it's, a, it's their scaled measures of the facility that people have in absorbing numeric and information. So their skill at absorbing new information, which correlates, but is not quite the same thing as education levels, obviously. So the point being, and climate change is kind of like the, you know, the, whatever the word is, the sort of the poster, the poster child for, for this one is that the people that are most likely to uh, sort of reject, if you will, the scientific consensus on climate change are actually the most educated opponents, not the least educated opponents. The idea being here, the psychological mechanism being discussed is a kind of filtering process where the more educated you are, if you know what information you're looking for, the more educated you are, the better you are at absorbing information that supports your case, instead of just getting confused. Uh -huh. Thank you. Susan. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> At least with respect to the bridges where you, you said you had the, the best or most standardized data, have you had a chance yet to look at whether or not there's a correlation between the financial status of a local government and the incidence of um, riskier bridges? We didn't look at that specifically, but 
I, you know, kind of eyeballing the list of counties that have a high percentage of, it didn't seem to be correlated, but that's only an eyeball test. It's not a statistical test, but um, the local governments vary tremendously in how many bridges they have, and, um, but I, it might be interesting to look at that, but I'd need a kind of, maybe I would use their fiscal stress score or something as the, the variable to look at a correlation and the percentage of structurally deficient bridges. We, we, I could take a look at that, but it wasn't part of the research that we've done so far. But I did kind of eyeball the list to see if some of the fiscally stressed counties are more likely to have uh, bridges, and it didn't seem to be the case, really. But, but it's a testable hypothesis. <laughs> I, uh, I have a question for Susan as well. It's more of a method. I'm over here. More of a methodological question on. Um, I assume you were saying the bridges and the dams. There's actually state people that go out and kind of expect or inspect it. And I assume there's probably like a very technical part behind that. But for the schools, you said it was based on like surveys of the mm -hmm. people that are in the schools and how they rate the building. Is well, that how or how is that? It's done? an engineer. They have to hire an architect or engineering firm to do the survey for each building. But the school board, I believe, the school, school officials actually are responsible for assigning the overall building condition rating. So that's um, less subjective probably than just relying on your engineer or architect. So it's, so it's, um, it's not, uh, and they hire the firm also, whereas you know, DOT is DOT and they're probably using a similar yard. It's probably easier to argue that DOT is using a similar yardstick for different bridges than um, the state education department in terms of rating buildings from different districts. Susan, and this is also for you. Um, you made, I think, a significant, although it's kind of well-recognized observation that state aid formulas <coughs> <coughs> are full of things like safe harmless that make them operate in ways that they were, that differ from where, what was originally intended. Right. I'm wondering, are you aware of, or has this controller's office thought about looking at those formulas and assessing their effectiveness in achieving the original goals, uh, you know, as altered by these, these kind of discrepancies? And I, school is one area, I, you know, I was also thinking that there are big issues around sewage disposal and stormwater and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of infrastructure out there that we need to be thinking about and how the state aid uh, formulas work. Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Um, I know we probably wouldn't look at regular education funding formulas because there are so many other people looking at that and we just don't have the expertise. Um, but I do see the school construction data is kind of understudied or not studied enough, and there would be an opportunity there, definitely, but it's not on our research agenda. Um, in terms of wastewater management, that would that's, that is water infrastructure is definitely something the controller has asked our research unit to look at. So there'll be opportunities there. I'm not sure that the scope you know, we have the resources to go as far as we would need to, but that would certainly be an interesting area of inquiry, especially if there's data, getting the data might be difficult there. I have, a follow -up, I have a follow up question related to that, related to linking our two pr proposals. So how would you expect better research on that topic to influence the uh, state aid formula? Which, oh, on, for buildings? For anything <laughs> <laughs> that, you're, think, that you know about, well, uh, it's a serious question. I don't want to. I'm well, not flip it about it because I, there are some contexts in which it will make a difference, and somewhere it won't. So. Yeah, I think I. Th this is me personally. I'm not speaking for the controller's office <laughs> in any way when I answer this question. Um, I think there are opportunities to sort of look at the unintended consequences are we are we building too much or are we structuring things in ways where we're driven to mm -hmm. to spend on one thing ra rather than take a broader view and a more mm, holistic view of infrastructure needs more generally so you know the way we do the school building votes it really does seem mm -hmm. targeted to 
have lots of school buildings and it makes sense, people like those, but they also need sewers. And <laughs> in some parts of the states, they really, really need good sewer systems and wastewater management systems. And those seem to get short shrift. So, I mean, the controller has a bully pulpit and can certainly speak to those issues. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, um, it would be hard to shift the entire policy dialogue, I think, but mm -hmm. it can definitely be a voice out there making those, raising those issues. So we'll have to see. Our research goes through a lot of review. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you. It could be we saved the best for last. It's hard to believe, but yeah. For David Kay, it's hard to believe. Uh, so we have uh, a session on metropolitan fiscal challenges. <laughs> And we are fortunate to have three uh, very good presentations. Uh, Stephen Ide from the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research is going to talk about Rust Belt cities and their burden of legacy costs. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Hubsman is going to talk about challenges to policymakers from changes in the composition of personal income from greater, for greater New York. And then Mildred Warner is going from Cornell University is going to talk about local government responses to fiscal stress in New York State. So Stephen, will you get us started? Just go right or left here. Okay. You just go right or left. Okay. If you need it, it's there. Oh, right, right. Yeah, there you go. Toggle? Maybe I got it stuck. Okay. There you go. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes, thank you. Fine. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much to the Rockefeller Institute for uh, allowing me to participate in this panel and to uh, convene this forum about what I, I personally think is an important topic. Um, I'm going to talk today about a paper I put out a few weeks ago called Rust Belt Cities and Their Burden of Legacy Costs. By legacy costs, I'm referring to both bonded debt obligation and also retirement benefit obligations. Um, this is a topic that attracted my interest um, for a couple of reasons, I think in general there's there's kind of a incre I've seen an increase in interest in the Rust Belt um, for a couple of reasons recently. The first is the election of President Donald Trump last year. Trump won a number of uh, Rust Belt states in part because of his big claims about making America great again and intimating that maybe something like a revival of heavy manufacturing in some of these areas might be possible. Um, and also, you know, in urban policy circles, there's a lot of interest in to what extent the revival of cities like New York and Boston, you know, legitimate comeback cities, what does that mean for these other places like Erie, Youngstown, um, Buffalo? Are those other places, are they about to turn a corner or why is the magic that has happened in New York City and Boston not quite, you know, happen in these other places? Or is it just a matter of time? So that's why, uh, that's the kind of context of what, of my, um, of my why I, why I took up this topic, um, so I'm trying to make a contrib. Another way to put this, I'm trying to make a contribution here to the debate about what is a realistic standard for urban revitalization. Like, what do we really mean when we talk about a comeback city? Um, you know, oftentimes when you, you're talking to someone and they they're talking about some city that really impressed them, you know, this this city has come very far. What they really mean is like, well, you know, there's a Starbucks in this downtown and there wasn't one there five ten years ago, or you know, the downtown just looks you know, shinier than it was five or ten years ago. I mean, you know, maybe that's, maybe there's something to that, maybe there's not. I'm trying to kind of move beyond the kind of anecdotal level to, to try to, you know, move towards what is the more kind of realistic, but also maybe a little bit more objective standard for what a comeback city is, for what urban revitalization is. For me, um, a revitalized city has to mean, for one thing, a solvent city, a city that is able to pay its bills in full and on time and provide an adequate level of municipal services. Um, there have been, in the past 10 years, a number of very high-profile municipal bankruptcies. Um, if you look out throughout Michigan, Pennsylvania, parts of 
New York. We still see many fiscally distressed cities. Um, so this issue of municipal solvency certainly cannot be taken for granted in the way that maybe people were taking it more for granted um, 20 years ago. Um, and, and whether, even if it's not the question of like bankruptcy, insolvency, we do see this phenomenon of what we talk about in public finance circles as crowd out of these costs of the past crowd taking more and more room in local budgets that could be going towards local services. Instead, they're having to fund the cost for the past. And that's a problem in terms of, you know, again, the social contract between citizens, taxpayers, and the municipal government. So what I did in terms of more concrete terms, what I did with these, what, what my paper, um, what I did, um, I looked at 96 cities in the Rust Belt in the Northeast and Midwest. That's what I mean by the Rust Belt, Northeast and Midwest. Midwest. 96 cities. Um, these are all. They all had a population of over 60,000, and all had a poverty rate above the state's average. So, a major 96 major poor Rust Belt cities, meaning poverty rate above the state average, population above 60,000. Um, and I looked at you know what's been happening with their tax bases, their local economies, and also their budgets um, going back several decades. So the first, you know, measure of, and I apologize in advance for the, 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 the slide I put together. They're, it's kind of busy. There are lots of numbers. It's difficult kind of getting my arms around 96 cities and all the data and presenting it. Believe this is, uh, that's actually fewer than 96 cities, so it's better than it could be. But um, um, apologize in advance. Um, this is just, I'm just going to sort of riff on the topics more than go in depth into, into any of the particular slides. Um, population, you know, population is a very rough measure of, of urban health, but it's not a useless one, I don't think. Um, of the 96 cities I looked at, 72 still have lo lower population than their industrial era peak. Cities, I found that cities, their population peaked at different times. The most common era for industrial era peak was the 1950s and 1960s, but some of them, their population peaked at a different time. Lowell, Massachusetts, for example, its population peaked in 1920, right before the textile industry started moving south. But um, so generally speaking, most Rust Belt cities still are shrunken cities. Um, they are, um, I also looked at um, poverty rates. Um, all of the cities that I studied um, had seen their poverty rates increase since 1970. 93 out of the 96 cities had seen their poverty rates increase at a more rapid rate, at a higher clip than the state, than the state um, poverty rate. Um, the... Um, I also looked, oh, well, here's a slide kind of looking at the overlap between population losses and poverty rates. If you, I, I looked at the 10, I, I pulled out of each, of the, 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 the population set and the poverty set, um, the poorest cities and the cities with the deepest population losses. Um, they shared the top 10, poorest cities, top 10, deepest population losses. They have overlapped in six out of 10 cases. So there's a fair amount of overlap between deep population losses and high poverty. Um, not not a perfect overlap, but a significant overlap. Probably not surprising. Um, um, incidentally, this, the data sources I was looking here most mostly from the, uh, from the census. Um, the census used to publish this thing called the City County Data Book that had come out every every ten years. And this, there are actually online resources that have most of these. And I also actually checked out a couple of physical copies of the online sources. But they were great. There's a great wealth of historical information about cities in these old City County Data Books. Um, great data resource. And then more recently, obviously, from the American Com Community Survey. Survey mostly um, debt. Another thing you get from the census is the debt. So in 71 out of 96 cases, um, the per capita debt burden had increased in real terms. That is to say, the um, I'm talking here about the bonded debt obligation. So most cases, most Rust Belt cities have more debt measured in real per capita terms now than they did in the early 1970s. Um, and then in retirement benefits, retirement benefits are a little bit more complicated to measure over time. Um, we, it, it's probably impossible to measure how much individual cities' retirement benefit burdens have increased since the early 1970s for a number of reasons, um, one of which has to do with the dark art of pension finance and how you value liabilities. Um, but even if you just go by the numbers that the cities themselves go by, by the way, I'm looking at retirement benefit li liabilities, both public pensions and retiree health care, sometimes called OPEB, other post-employment benefits, um, also a significant long-term financial liability for cities. Um, I was able to get 
total data for, for these liabilities for 66 of the cities. And in most of those cases, 46 out of the 66 cases, retirement benefit liabilities were larger than their bonded debt liabilities. So in most cases that I had data for, the retirement benefit liabilities were larger than the bonded debt, bonded debt liabilities. Excuse me. It, the people who are very involved in this kind of you know, geeky pension policy issue about how you value liabilities, you say that pension liabilities are you estimated using, using excessively optimistic projections. If you go by their reasoning, that would mean these liabilities are much larger, and in probably every single one of these cases, the retirement benefit liabilities are larger than the bonded benefit liabilities. But they're big, and even if you just use the numbers that they're using. Um, so just to, to pause briefly where I'm, I'm at here, you know, um, this is um, already what we've seen is that over time, these generally speaking for Rust Belt cities, in most cases, their tax bases has gotten weaker and their long-term debt obligations have gotten um, more significant, have, have grown. Um, I, I, I neglected to mention here, I'm talking about central cities. I'm not talking about regions, counties, metros. Um, that's an important, that's certainly valuable to look at those. Um, nor am I talking about, it's also important to look at what's happening in the neighborhoods in these various cities. If you're having, um, okay. Um, the, um, because the central city is what stands behind the benefit obligations, not the metro, not the neighborhood. So that's why I think what's happening in the city limits um, is important. Um, <coughs> And uh, so, to, um, and, and when we're talking about these these pension liabilities, the bonded debt liabilities, you know, there are a lot of cases. This is I'm not really talking about pension mismanagement necessarily, necessarily, because you have some cases in pensions, in pension, and governments these days. The state of New Jersey, state of Connecticut, really notorious in terms of their bad pension management. But that's been an issue of a lack of willingness to pay. When you're talking about these very, very weak tax bases, it's a it's an inability to pay, and that's what we see in a lot of cases in the Rust Belt. Um, very. Um, Quickly, because I know I'm running out of time here, uh, manufacturing, it's really extraordinary if you look back how much manufacturing jobs used to take up of the total tax base. In many cities, you had over 50% of the jobs in 1950 were in manufacturing. That's not the case. And by the way, the good news is their, their economies, at least in terms of their job bases, are more diverse. No job category is over 50% at this point. Um, and... Um, so very quickly, the other story with um, the tax base, also very significant concentration these days in nonprofit industries, education, higher, higher edu and, and health care. That's a big problem in light of how much local governments rely on their, on the property tax. They can't tax a part of the tax base act that's actually growing. So um, in general, this is a picture. So what, whatever way you look at the tax base, the, the, the revenue sources, the, um, the, the poverty tax rates, um, real challenges relative to what you're looking at on the, if, on the expenditure side of the budget versus the revenue side of the budget, you're looking at them together. This is a picture of downtown Pittsburgh. Looks great. Look, I love Rust Belt cities. I visited a number of them as part of my research for this report. Um, I wish them the best, but in terms of looking at their fundamentals, I have a lot of concern about what we're going to see going forward. I believe that municipal bankruptcy is go still going to be a very, very rare event in terms of the totality of local governments, the thousands of local governments we have out there, but I think it's going to be a little bit more common than it has been um, in the past. Um, I'll stop there because I know I'm out of time and hopefully we can get to more in the, um, the Q&A. Thanks. Just the, uh, the right one? Hello. Hello. Um, I want to add my thanks to, uh, for the invitation to, to contribute to the conference. And, uh, and I, I, I believe I attended this uh, last year. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see it from this perspective for a change. Um, what I'm going to present today are really preliminary findings. They're sort of a side trip that I took in trying to get a better understanding of fiscal risk and how local governments were responding to uh, the recession, the period of recovery, the period between 2000 and 2015, okay? So um, in terms of the, the way that I would normally do work and so forth, this would be sort of my initial survey, my first pass, trying to get a sense as to whether or not there's something under these rocks or not, okay? So I, I took the... Uh, the work in progress part of this uh, seriously. And, I, and you should keep it in mind as well. The focus of the study, um, or the description, is uh, 
focus, it centers on personal income. Bureau of Economic Analysis has been collecting information on personal income. By personal income, we mean things like wages and salaries, um, dividends, interest, and rent, personal current transfer receipts, all the things that go into the way the BEA counts up how much money we as people, not as businesses, um, earn. There are other ways to measure this. The, the IRS has adjusted gross income. There's the CPS. But for our purposes, uh, for my purposes at least, uh, this seemed like a, a reasonable place to begin. So um, there's more detail on how they tabulate this and how they reach a personal income, but I'm going to try and respect the clock. The, uh, the second part of my interest in this was in an effort to try and see some of the macro trends that we're seeing at the national level and whether or not these are visible at the local level. Demographic trends, sluggish economic growth and recovery, uh, rising share of the financial economy, um, and declining labor force participation rates are just a few of the kinds of things that we would expect in some form or another to impact personal income. And the question is whether or not we, we will actually see this in the, the activity and behavior at the local level. I should stop and say all of the data that I'm going to be talking about are drawn primarily from three sources, Bureau of Economic Analysis, U.S. Census, um, and then OSC, uh, Office of State Comptroller. So with that in mind, some initial slides just about some of these larger trends. This is a census projection of the share of population for the U.S. that will be age 65 and old, older by year. I imagine we've all seen versions of this in one form or another, so it's, it's really more just to say, yep, this, this, <laughs> we still expect this. This is shares of uh, GDP under the NAICS system. Um, what you can see from this is, is sort of this well-worn decline in the manufacturing sector, which is in deep blue on the bottom. The gold section, uh, colors by me, would be uh, uh, finance, uh, insurance, and real estate. That looks a little bit different today than it used to under the SIC codes, uh, just because the things have been reapportioned a bit. But I'm sure you're all familiar with the trends in the composition of, uh, of the economy. Labor force participation rates, the happy news in this is that we see a lift in 2016 after several years of, uh, of rather dramatic decline. Um, arguments for these vary. Three questions are taken up in, um, in this sort of brief survey. What are the trends in wage and non-wage income? And I should just stop and say wage is wages and salaries or wages and salaries and supplements. Non-wage consists of two things and we're going to break those out. It consists of dividends, interest, and rent. Think about your pension, your 401k. Think about financial assets. Okay? Personal current transfer receipts. Think about a social security check or a disability check or an unemployment check. These are things that we receive as transfers. They all count as income. Given a longer story I won't bore you with, um, we're going to leave out proprietary income and we're going to leave out farm income. Not because they're unimportant, just because they're, the changes in them are not as dramatic, at least in this past. They might be in another one. Um, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, are there demographic differences between the counties where we see high shares, a high percentage of personal income attributed to wage, dividends, interest, and rent, and PCTR? Um, are they different, or are we just measuring age? I mean, is this just another way of looking at, at changes in age composition? And are there patterns, or at least differences, in the revenue and expenditure behavior of local governments that are specific to these places that have higher proportions of these different sources of income. All right, so we're connecting up, the economy has changed, the source and uh, the demographics have changed, and so income likewise. How does that, if at all, translate down to the local level? I'm gonna need to go a lot faster, so I will try. This is the evolution of personal income. What I'd like you to watch is the bottom and the top. Um, the top is financial income, all right, DIR is what we're, we're gonna be calling it, and the bottom is wages. Above that, there are two groups, and those represent supplements to wages. So if you add those in, um, it doesn't look quite as bad. It's still downward, but it, it doesn't look quite as awful. But when you consider the rise of the gig economy, uh, part-time work, all of these kinds of things, for which you don't have uh, supplements and benefits, it's good to keep in mind what's happening with wages and salary. Not the whole story, but perhaps more important over time. In personal income in New York State, 
You see a similar kind of trend, but what you have to keep in mind in this is that it's coming off of a lower share to begin with. Okay? I'm going to move along quicker. Greater New York. When we take New York City and the adjoining five counties out of it, um, we see that, again, we've got a smaller share of wages down there on the bottom and that it's also declining. And just to give you a sense of the difference in scale, the 10 counties in and around New York City, that is their nominal trend over time. And in, on a comparable scale down on the bottom, that is the 52 counties of greater New York. So about a third of, of total personal income as compared to, um, as compared to the 10 counties in, New, in the New York area. So to include the 10 counties in the New York City area would be to dramatically change our idea about what's going on. And we're going to avoid that. I'm not following the census area that was described earlier. I am including Duchess and Ulster in this, just so you know. So when we look uh, over time, I mean, basically, <laughs> I can hardly see those from there. And I imagine you would have a tough time, too. Um, <laughs> Let me flip to, the, uh, to my notes so at least I can see them here. Essentially what you'll, uh, the, the takeaway from that is that essentially you have um, shares of income that have uh, declined in terms of, of wage and salary. For example, personal income in Greater New York was 63.7% in 1970. Today it stands at 49.4% whereas dividends, interest, and rent has gone from 18.5 in 1970 to 22.3. Uh, PCTR, which is again transfer payments and so forth, has gone from a little under 10% to just over 20%. So fairly dramatic changes just on a percentage basis. Okay? Um, when we look at... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm tempted to keep walking over in that direction. Um, Is it an absolute decline in wages and salary that is, is driving this? Well, no, it's not. It's not that wages and salaries have gone south. They're decreasing as a share, OK? What's happening is, is that the other components are increasing more rapidly. And if I had 45 minutes, I'd probably tell you all about what's going on in this, which is kind of fascinating because it sort of tracks what happened with um, the, the financial crisis in 2009. But you can. Read about it online when they put it up. Um, this is particularly, I, I didn't expect to stumble across this, and it's not really germane to, uh, to the study. But this looks at per capita wages and salary over wage and salary employment. Not per capita, but per wage and salary worker. And it aggregates it. What I want to call your attention to is that at the beginning and the end years, they are roughly identical. The top bar is total employment. The blue and orange bars are um, wages and salaries, and then wages and salaries um, uh, plus benefits, supplements. And what I did, it, it looks like it's going up, modestly, but it's going up. But then at the end, I adjusted for income. And the level is just below where it was in 2000. <laughs> so it really means that in terms of people who are relying on wages and salary, um, and the places in which they live, that they haven't experienced any dramatic increase or even a measurable increase in their purchasing power. And that certainly affects the way they think about their taxes, which probably have gone up with inflation, right? And it affects the way that they perceive the choices that they have. Not so the case for people who are uh, relying on dividends, interest, and rent. Dividends, interest, and rent and PCTR follow two similar but different um, <laughs> You've got a call. <laughs> I was afraid mine was going to go off, <laughs> so I took the matter out. Um, dividends, interest, and rent and PCTR both follow an increasing trend, right? But what's interesting about it is the yellow PCTR, okay, again, transfer payments, it's fairly smooth. You see a spike uh, for the financial crisis and recession, as you would expect an increase in sort of counter cyclical. Uh, federal payments. But if you look at, uh, and you can barely see it, the sort of pale purple uh, behind it, it's much more following the stock market. Right? So we have two groups of people who are receiving this type of income, but their expectations for receiving income follow very different expectations. Right? One is a gradual change, and it basically tracks demographic differences, and the other one varies with 
essentially the stock market, or so it would appear. Right? Moving through. So I divide New York counties into three groups of counties. New, uh, this is greater New York. Um, this is wage and salary counties highlighted in blue. And I apologize for the projection of the map PowerPoint betrayed me. Um, <laughs> so we've got about 20 counts, counties there. PCTR counties are there. Dividends, interest, and rent. Interesting, right? Not, not entirely where I'd expect them to be. There's a tiny bit of overlap between some of these, um, but uh, there's, there's enough separation that I feel like I, can, I, can, I could proceed and, and look at them in terms of groups. Now, before we get any further, right, we go back to this question. Are they just simply a uh, difference in ages right, between the counties? A bit, yeah, there's some difference, but when we look at uh, the overall difference between the counties, we, we find that on average, again, average, um, that the differences between them are not as striking as we might expect between places that have a very high share of wages and salaries versus places that um, have a very high percentage of, say, transfer payments. Um, between 2000 and 2015, um, if we look at the share of population age 65 or older, uh, the DIR, the dividends, interest, and rent counties, 17.8, PCTR, 21, and wage and salary, basically 16. The difference, of course, is that some of these places are growing and some are declining. The PCTR transfer payment counties, on average, were declining. The DIR were growing at 3%, and the places with wages and salaries were growing at just under 2%. They were growing slower, right? That, that'll sort of come back. In terms of median age, again, we don't see the kind of wide disparity that we would expect. About 40 years old in wage and salary, that's a median age. And in, this is in 2015. And in DIR, about 42 and a half. And in PCTR, about 42 and a half. So we're not seeing the kind of radical difference that, that might suggest that these are on the face just a measurement of um, uh, of age differences between counties. Um, so essentially, uh, I'll skip through this. I compare uh, the counties, because this is the part that we want to actually take a look at. I take all of the municipalities within a county. I aggregate their revenues and expenditures. I calculate percent shares. This is level one OSC data, right? So we're just talking about general government, health. We're not talking about the components underneath. That will be interesting and that will be a next step. Um, in terms of revenues, I'm not breaking out sales and use tax. It's all in that big category of sales use. So I can't provide the level of detail at this stage that I would like to about what is exactly driving this. A few things to, to observe from just this initial comparison. Um, wage, and wage and salary counties have the highest share of debt throughout the period as a percentage of total revenues. It grew steadily over the period. DIR saw a rapid increase in total debt in the years preceding the recession, only to pull back sharply between 2010 and 2015. And PCTR debt uh, outstanding hovered between 36 and 37 percent over, uh, over the period. This suggests that w wage share and DIR counties engaged in more debt financed activities either because of preferences or needs or because their fiscal position gives them better access to debt markets relative to places with declining population. Speculation on my part. From this, we, we can't know, but um, I'm, I'm just sort of throwing that out there for, for you folks. In terms of per capita debt, DIR, DIR per capita debt levels rose rapidly between 2000 and 2010, while uh, wage, share, wage share declined from higher levels in 2000 and 2010, settling uh, at something like DIR counties in, in 2015. I'll move a little bit quicker here. Uh, property taxes. Um, in 2015, wage share counties derive a smaller share of total revenue from property taxes compared to the other two groups, right? Wage share counties' uh, property taxes rose steadily uh, from 22% in 2000 as a share of total revenue to 25% in 2015. DIR counties had a sharper rise from 27% in 2000 to 32% in 2015. And PCRT counties had a three percentage point increase between 28, um, excuse me, between 2000 and 2010 to 28%, um, and finished up a little bit higher. I doubt very much. Mike, am I, am I, is that the one minute? Close. 
Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to move forward to, there, there are a number of differences in terms of um, their revenue behavior. You can see the state aid that's been mentioned by a number of people as shares, so I feel like presentations today have to some degree at least confirm that I'm not way off base in terms of sort of these initial findings. When we look at um, spending, I'll just throw out a couple of highlights. Again, this is as a share. I should say that I calculate all of this as well as per capita inflation adjusted sh shares as well. And essentially they follow very similar trends. Um, we saw large increases in general government spending. Um, and this was uh, led by wage share groups, uh, wage share counties. Public safety, um, which has been mentioned a number of times today, the, the share of public safety spending was flat for wage share counties. Again, this is places where we have the largest share of income coming from people who are working at jobs as opposed, and so we think of those people, though we're gonna have to change the way we think about those people, as being between 25 and 55, although we are seeing more labor force participation from older workers now that we hadn't, hadn't seen in the past. But still, we're thinking about people in those prime earning years where they consume an enormous amount of their income. I'm going to use my, my last minute as judiciously as I can. Um, transportation spending was, uh, was steady, uh, increasing for PCTR and DRR counties over the period. Um, wage share, smaller increase. I guess what I would point to here is that if you have a chance to look at this, what I think you might find is if you think about the DIR and PCTR counties as being places where people have the capacity to pay and they also have strong preferences, and they may uh, represent populations that have certain service needs that are extraordinarily important to them, like transportation, like public safety, these kinds of things, that we may be seeing an effect of that, right? Um, and now I'm, I'm just gonna <laughs> sneak on down to the, to the end of this. The one um, slide that I, I would really like to show is over the period, all, of, all three groups contracted in terms of their total revenues, okay? Everybody undertook a kind of austerity response, right? But over the entire period of 2000 to 2015, and I'm gonna do this from memory because I can't see the slide here, DIR counties had a net an inflation adjusted contraction of 3%. PCTR counties had a contraction of 11%. Wage and salary counties, working people, places with jobs, saw a contraction of 9%. So in terms of the ability of these aggregated local governments to weather and come back out of the, uh, the recession, it seems that initially, and again, very preliminary, that places that had uh, sources of income coming in uh, from dividends, inter interest, and rent, were able to get back to or closer to their previous spending levels as compared to places where most of the personal income was coming from wage and salary slash job employment. And that was a surprise to me. And that's really what motivates uh, sort of the next step in this is trying to get a handle on um, how our expectations uh, for local finance, sources of revenue, and the kinds of services that are required by different populations are subject to change as a result of a changing economy which is now visible at the local level. Um, and I will stop there so as not to be too selfish and say thank you. And we're out. All right, great. Thank you very much, and thanks to Mike Hattery and the Rockefeller Institute for letting us be here. This is a, another paper coming off of the 2017 survey that we did of all cities, towns, counties, and villages in New York State this past April. And this time I'm going to talk more generally about local government responses to fiscal stress. Uh, Austin presented on the override. I'm going to be more general. So as we think about these issues, 
Um, what I want you to, to realize is that local government is sitting in the context of changing state policy, the changing economy, and changing demography. And all of these things are, are pressing on local government. You're not just caught between a rock and a hard place. You're a rock and a hard place and something even harder. Um, and it's really uh, very difficult for local government to push back on any of these sources of stress. Um, but with inside the local government organization, what kinds of strategic management strategies might you see? And some of the big ones you see are cuts and revenue enhancements and service innovations. The first panel about shared services as an opportunity. And what we're finding in our research, there's a lot of political geography research that says local government is now becoming the austerity machine. It's just cutting, it's privatizing, that this is happening worse in poorer places, and that instead of being the growth machine, which is how we've understood local government historically, we should now think of it as the austerity machine. Uh, my research does not support that. What I'm seeing is pragmatic and strategic management by local government, uh, holding on, trying to maintain services, trying to explore new revenue options, and trying to continue to be an a service providing organization to their citizens. This dark, bleak view of the austerity machine, I don't find supported in the national data, and I don't see it supported in New York State either. So what's been happening, we're looking at um, inflation adjusted trends in Property tax, which has been essentially flat and declining in real terms in New York State for the last decade. Um, state aid, which has really been the thing that's plummeted. Um, uh, sales tax, which has dropped a little. And um, charges, even though some of the literature says charges is in increasing, when you look across all local governments, it's not. For cities, yes, because you can charge, maybe villages too, but for counties and towns, finding chargeable services is more difficult. And so um, the, the depressing thing about this is all these trends are down. When your revenue is down and your expenditures are up, you're in a situation that's not going to sustain over time. One of the things that's been um, referenced in, in Stephen's uh, paper is this idea that we've got a changing structure of our economy. And as we shift to meds and eds and away from manufacturing, we have a structural problem that our taxes, our property tax, which is a major source of revenue for local government, um, doesn't tax the growing meds and eds sector. And then the sales tax, which is another really important source for local government, we don't charge sales tax on services, and yet we are now primarily a service economy. So we really need to, for the 21st century, we really need to think about restructuring our revenue sources to reflect the economy that we've got. And just for fun, um, here's the city of Albany. 59% of, 66% I mean, of the equalized value is exempt, Jeez. and most of that is the state. We go to my hometown of Ithaca, 60% of equalized value is exempt, and that's my employer, Cornell University. <laughs> and go up to the city of Syracuse, they've got 56% equalized value is exempt, and that's heavily the state, and then heavily uh, Upstate Medical Center, Syracuse University. Then let's look at demo demo demography. I mean, New York State is shrinking, except for a few places, my home county, New York City, some of the uh, areas around that, Buffalo, Rochester area, and Albany. But everywhere else is shrinking population. So the concern you're raising, Stephen, about you know, how do places with shrinking population continue to the future, we really need to think about that. So we've, had, we've talked a little about, about state policy, demography, and economy, and you realize that these are, these are trends that are beyond local government's ability to control. So when we did this survey back in April, we were asking, OK, what do you see as your sources of stress, and what are your responses to them? And we're really happy to report that we got a fabulous response rate, um, especially from, from cities and villages, um, and really good geographic distribution across the state. And I believe uh, Austin showed you this slide earlier of the sources of stress, and a lot of them are state-related. Some of them are, are, are structural budget issues that you can't do much about. Some of them are economic-related, and some of them are population-related. So what causes fiscal stress? You think about the structure of government. So we differentiated for city, county, town, village. We didn't get anything significant in our regression results. We differentiated on state policy for state mandates, state rules that might raise your costs, like prevailing wage, WICs, et cetera, 
and employee benefits as a percent of total expenditure. And the one that holds up significant in the regression model is state mandates, which is one of the themes you constantly hear local governments talk about as a concern. Uh, on the economy, we control for uh, their measures of economic development stress and aging infrastructure, aging infrastructure, because we're older cities, um, and that relates to uh, the, uh, Susan's comment earlier about <laughs> roads and bridges. Um, and again, those are things that lead to higher uh, perceptions of stress. And then on population, we controlled for over 65, population change, population size, percent poverty, and percent college educated. And it's the poorer places that are feeling more stress. Again, that would be um, seconded in the, in the two presentations you just saw before. So when we ask local government officials, what are the, what are the needs most affected by the, uh, the stress, they said um, infrastructure investments. We're not making infrastructure investments. We can't. And we're not doing long-term planning. This is bad news, folks. We're not looking to the future. And then they said, uh, we're cutting rec recreation and elder services. This is bad news. We're an aging society. <laughs> and we're cutting social services. We, we did a whole series of focus groups in the... Uh, fall of 2015 that, that then we use that to develop the, Thursday, the survey questions. And so the survey results, I guess not surprisingly, confirmed what we had heard in the focus groups. But now we have quantitative data to compare it. We ask them what you're cutting. They're cutting road repair. Y'all know it. <laughs> you, you see the potholes. You see the, the deferred maintenance on the roads. They're cutting youth recreation. They're cutting police. This is a big budget area. Your public works, your public safety, those are your big budget areas. That's where you're trying to cut. Um, the ones that are circled in red are where they report, over 45% of respondents report strong community opposition to the cuts. So these are ones that people are starting to see. They see police, they see brush pickup and snow, um, they see their library and their elder services, they're worried about dispatch. A lot of the others, like the planning, the economic development, those maybe they don't see quite as well. And we ask them, are you, cutting, are you cutting budget, are you cutting staff, are you cutting service frequency? Budget's the first thing, staff's the second, frequency's the third. So when we did our statistical analysis and the factor analysis, the actions grouped into two groups. Cuts, personnel cuts, reduce personnel benefits, reduce services, consolidate departments, sell assets, eliminate services, privatize, consider bankruptcy, which almost nobody does. Um, and then revenue enhancements, shared services, that was the first panel today, apply for more grants, if you can get them, um, defer capital expenditures, which we've been talking about, increase user fees, consider government consolidation, adopt new user fees, increase collection efforts, and start to use volunteers for your services. And what you'll see is that the average, across all the governments who respond, the typical government is providing twice as many, is doing twice as many efforts to enhance revenue as it is cuts. So again, this pragmatic, strategic management, looking at how you can manage your way forward out of the crisis. So we run a structural equation model, and uh, the paper is available upon request, um, where we control for your perception of fiscal stress as it relates to local government structure, state policy, economy, and demogra demography. And then we, we run that into what you do, whether you do more cuts or more revenue enhancements. And I thought you might be interested in what we see, because I already told you the results um, leading to fiscal stress, what leads to more cuts and more revenue enhancements. So since everybody's doing both, what leads to both is bigger places, places that feel that state rules are constraining them, places that have higher perceptions of fiscal stress, and then places that are building coalitions with their business community, neighborhood groups to um, address fiscal stress, places that are doing long-term thinking, and Places are doing both of these despite any communion, community or union opposition. So managers know how to manage through um, conflict. And so if they're facing more community or union opposition, they're more likely to do more cuts and more revenue. Maybe it could be that the causality is the other way around. But they're, they're managing through it. Those places that do more cuts are counties. Places that have an anti-tax sentiment 
and places that have more tax-exempt land. Places that are doing more revenue enhancements tend to be more politically liberal. They share more. They're more likely to have a higher level of college education. And they're complaining of lack of funds for innovation, even though they're doing more. So if we go back to our first picture, when we looked at the stressors coming down on you, state policy, the bigger stressors are mandates and state rules. Demography, the biggest stressor is poverty. Economy, the biggest stressors are tax-exempt land, economic development challenges, aging infrastructure, and actually sales tax volatility is also there. But then when you look inside the organization, what you're seeing is a strategic, pragmatic response that's more heavily on the revenue and innovation side than on the cuts side. And th those that are more likely on the cuts are the ones that are um, tax-exempt counties or anti-tax sediments. And those more on the revenue side tend to be more liberal, more likely to share, and um, more likely to be college educated. Thank you. So, any questions? Ah, oh, come on. Yeah, we do have some. All of these were interesting papers. I'm going to ask Mildred first uh, a question. <coughs> when, she, when you defined revenue side versus the cut side, you sounded, it sounded like the definition that said that there are more revenue actions was based on the number of actions as opposed to the amount of revenue generated as to amount, the amount of revenue or uh, expenditure cuts. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so really you could have a lot of small revenue things and a few large cuts and the impact would be quite different than what you look, what you're presented in terms of the fiscal impact. We're not looking at fiscal impact in this paper. We're looking at actions that local governments do. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking, if you're exploring the opportunity of expanded user fees, they may not be generating much money, but you're thinking about this as an alternative. So this is really, one of the, one of the values of this survey is it's attitudinal and action-based, getting behind what the numbers show, because the numbers right now aren't showing big changes yet, and I think it's because people are holding on. And I think the big changes are about, are going to be coming. And so what this survey was trying to get at is what are you doing, what are you thinking as a way to anticipate what's gonna happen in the future. Excuse me. Uh, Dr. Warner, um, you put up a slide on the uh, the it was state aid to local governments. Um, was that just AIM funding? Because those numbers were extremely low. That was all funding that goes to any local government in New York State. So it's at, it's it's the including funding for education, funding chips funding, funding no, for economic development. No, education's not in there. Yeah. So. The, I mean, those numbers can't, that's super low. It's super well, low. this is general purpose local governments, so it wouldn't include education aid? Yeah, it's not, it doesn't include education, and it's cities, counties, towns, and villages. Same. Okay. And it's in real terms. It's not current. It's real dollars. I, I've seen other it's, information it's that would dollars. say that general pur other aids besides general purpose aid have not compensated for the loss of of state aid. That's comptroller's data, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's comptroller's data. It's the way the comptroller defines that data. Yeah. It's also self reported by the local governments. Anybody else? <coughs> I had a question on the slide that you had for tax exempt properties. Was that as a percent of the grand list value, as a percentage of the, of the land? What was that? Um, it was percent of it for county uses, um, just to show it in like a map. It was just for, I pulled that data from the Department of Tax and Real Property Value or something, and it was the percent of property tax for county uses that was tax exempt. So it would be a percentage of the overall tax base that was displaced by tax exempt property. So if the total value of 
the grand list was $100. <laughs> Tell me a simple example. How would that work? So if the grand value was $100 and the, the assessed value of the tax-exempt land was $10, it would have said 10%. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, you know, one of the things that, that I don't know that we always look at is the amount of money that comes in per square foot, right? Because that's the bottom line of a, of a locality is how much revenue do I have coming in? And one of the things that I don't think we often look at enough is the size of the locality. Mm -hmm. So if the locality is very small and it has a, a large amount of tax exempt property, um, they may be a lot more likely to do things uh, like do pilots and, and things like that uh, because they're looking at how much revenue they can create from per square footage. And Mike turned me on to this group, Urban 3, which, uh, right, is that the mm, name of it? Right. Which has a great analysis on its website of Asheville, where they're located, and how much uh, dense downtown property is so much more economical and so much more valuable to the municipality than further out, you know, surface parking areas, and the and the values are a lot different. And uh, the, the 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 dearness of property lost to a small town to a tax exempt is much higher than the dearness of the loss to a town that has lots of land. And I think a lot of times we don't look um, as much at the size, the actual physical size of land, since the town can only tax property what's built on the land and, you know. Question for Stephen. Um, I may have misinterpreted you, but it felt to me like you ended at a rather dismal place <laughs> for uh, Rust Belt cities with, you know, some bankruptcies uh, likely to increase. Um, I'm wondering if either the work you've done already or the future, where you're going to take this work in the future, if you have any thought about what's going to differentiate those Rust Belt cities that actually succeed from those that don't, given the distribution of burdens, uh, legacy burdens that you, you've identified? Well, clearly, the, you know, there's a spectrum of Rust Belt cities. I mean, you know, you have at the very top, I would say, New York City, um, perhaps also Boston. I think any, by any objective standard, in, both in terms of a, where people thought they were in the 70s versus where they are now, really um, exciting and you can go on for a long time about their accomplishments. At the other end, you have places which poverty rates are like hovering around percent Detroit, Flint, Youngstown, Camden, um, you know, over 50% population losses. And then you have a lot that are in the middle that are, um, you know, experience teaches us that most cities are going to muddle through for a long time. Um, I mean, uh, that it, when you're talking about like authentic insolvency, um, it's going to be rare. And it's also very difficult to predict which city is going to be at the precipice. I mean, a city that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about recently is Hartford, Connecticut. I don't know if you all followed this, but Hartford was on the brink of bankruptcy one month ago. I mean, without exaggeration. Um, and um, Hartford, uh, it was five years ago, no one was saying, well, everybody watch Hartford. I mean, the rating agencies weren't saying that everyone, that Hartford was about to snap. But, you know, nowadays, five years from now, there could be some city out there in Pennsylvania, upstate New York, um, Ohio, which is going to be kind of the Hartford of that era five years from now. But so all I can do is look at kind of generally at the fundamentals. And I think the fundamentals aren't, um, aren't so great. By the way, I wanted to follow, actually Hartford is a good, the, the last comment you made about the small tax base and the high proportion of taxes and property. This is a huge issue of, of, of in, in Hartford, the pilot issue, the tax exempt issue. It essentially has a taxable tax base, the size of a suburb, and is trying to support the city on that tax base. It, actually lower than West Hartford. Yes. Right. And it's, and it's created this big, a very inefficient tax system because the, the actual tax base has shrunk so far, they had to jack up the rate really, really high, the highest tax rate in the state by a wide margin. And there, although there's no legal reason why Hartford can't raise taxes anymore, it is the view of its, its city council and it's the de totally democratic city, liberal city. They're saying that economically they're at their revenue limit. They can't tax themselves anymore and they just 
there has to be another option. And, and it depended on a state bailout for them to, to avoid bankruptcy. Anybody else? I just have a quick one for Mr. Hubschman. Um, I, I, you presented a chart up there that uh, looked at kind of the median income growth. <coughs> and at the, the last bar uh, was adjusted for uh, constant dollar as opposed to current dollar. Correct. But then the next chart you went to was all current dollar. And so it made it look like dividend income and transfer payments were increasing over the time period. But if you presented it in constant dollar terms, I'm not sure that you would have found that because if you presented it in the same way you presented the last chart, I think it would have looked quite different. So I'm just, it's just a concern about data presentation that you make sure that you're not shifting back and forth too much at one time. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's for that reason that using the shares sometimes makes it a little bit easier if you're going to try and show actual comparison dollar amounts, which become important when you're comparing service costs per capita at the local level. But I take your point. It's There's one more thing, too, that's also interesting in the data, and that's that if you look at kind of the growth of the economy over the past 15 years, mm -hmm. the growth of the gig economy really is striking compared with kind of the stagnant of employment growth. Almost all of the growth has been in kind of in the non-traditional employment category. Even, even, and it's, it's not different in different places. It's pretty much everywhere that that's true. Mm -hmm. So that has a big implication for kind of where all of this goes and your concern about kind of the ability of communities to, uh, to, re to respond to that kind of change. Indeed. Thank you. Anybody else? I know oh. I already spoke, but I don't think I do. Just be thankful that you have county government, because Hartford has to provide every service on its own. There's no county to help them out, and Connecticut got rid of its county government like 1961, I think. Hey, you're the expert on Connecticut. I said you're the expert on Never Connecticut. Never really had <laughs> counties like other states had counties, but yeah. but they. Yeah. Hartford, you know, all you have to do is move four blocks in either direction and cut the property taxes in, in half and get kids in better schools. So it's kind of hard to keep up for people living in the cities. Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven are three of the smallest cities in the United States, and they have to go entirely alone with no county services whatsoever. So they have to be the county and the city. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> we have a over here and right behind you, Ursa. That's that's all right. I I feel compelled to respond to that. <laughs> so it's not not a question, and 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 some of you have heard me mention this before, including at Albany Law a couple of weeks ago. It's important when looking at. <coughs> Okay, it's important <laughs> when, when looking at the role of counties in New York to recognize that they are by and large not the same as what you will find in most other states, e.g. Virginia, uh, I, I can't speak to Connecticut, um, and, and the key distinction is, is this. Most of the functional roles of counties in New York are the roles that are played by state governments in other states. They are uh, management of public assistance, child welfare, um, and, a, and a whole range of, and, and, and of course, you know, the, the elephant in the room, Medicaid, financially at least, even though the managerial role is considerably reduced from what it was five or ten years ago. Um, so, in New York, a county is, to my mind, not the same as a county in Connecticut, Virginia, um, and obviously not Massachusetts, but in, in, I would wager, most states. So I'd, I'd be real careful about making that comparison. I have a question for Mildred and one for Jonathan. Um, M Mildred, your work showed a, I think it was an explanatory relationship that related uh, perceptions about uh, levels of fiscal stress to state mandates. I'm just wondering if you could unpack that a little more, particularly 
what you think about ca you know causality directions in that you know what's going on in that relationship and then I'll ask if I could Jonathan a question um, on the on the survey we just said state mandates and um, one of the things we're trying to do with our national project now is to get at differences in state mandates on local governments across the 50 states and yeah there is a chicken or an egg problem um, but the reality is that a lot of local governments are facing fiscal stress and a lot of states are downloading their stress onto local governments. It's p beautiful politically because you still offer services to your citizens, you don't pay for them, you require the lower level of government to pay for them. And since counties are used in the states that have them to deliver state services, they can do this without providing the adequate aid to cover it. And, and this is called, the academics are now calling this scalar dumping. So one scale of, dump, of, of government dumps on the next, and we're seeing this happen from states to local governments across the country. So for Jonathan, one of the things I think is interesting to think about uh, is within the categories you're looking at what that what the distribution is hmm. so you're looking at totals so you know thinking about who gets within the category of unearned income who gets that income and so I'm, so the question i'm going to have to you is and similarly within wage you know and i think a working hypothesis would be that it's much more that unearned income is much more unevenly distributed across the population that uh, than the earned income is and I'm so my question though is would thinking about that make any difference to where you're going with your analysis can if you, you had the data? Can can you say a little bit more about? Well, I mean, in ter so as an as a regional economist, which is a lot of what I do, uh, a lot of what affects the economy within the region is what people who get income do with it, mm -hmm. yeah, and right. how they spend it, right. what they spend it on, whether they spend it locally or not, and what kinds of things they spend it on, and, and the types of spending patterns that you're going to see from unearned income, particularly if it's going to very rich people, is going to be very different than if it's earned income. Yeah, absolutely. The difficulty, of course, is in trying to pair this to specific groups, right? And trying to, uh, the, the other uh, data sets on ad adjusted gross income or um, sort of uh, consumer spending and so on. Uh, part, of the, part of the difficulty is in trying to pair it, right? Because just using age statistics don't do it, right? Because you don't know if you've got the right person or the right share, right? You can also have people who are asset rich um, and income poor, right? So the difficulty really, um, is the, the scale of the data, number one. But then s even if you could take it down to the municipal level, in terms of being able to parse it out to say, all right, I have this many rich people over 65, or, or this many rich people that are, that are living on dividends, interest, and rent, because it's, it's, it's not just retirees, it's also people who are <coughs> retired hedge fund managers at 45, or five-year-olds with trust funds, or anyone else that uh, might own a building or that's in their name and receiving income. So it's not purely an age question. Um, and that level of detail is extremely challenging so far, right? I think that one of the ways that you can uh, try and approach this is to sort of know them by their fruits, right? We expect your regional economists, so we expect higher levels of consumption from prime, prime age workers, right? Um, but there's probably a, a pattern of expenditure that we haven't seen for long enough among well-heeled retirees that uh, will be characteristic, and we may be paying attention to that pattern of consumption as they become one of the um, engine demographics for, 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 local, uh, for local growth, right? I, one of the things that I, I didn't get an opportunity to mention, but I think is sort of vitally important gets to your question, um, the group of people that we're seeing entering retirement now are, to put it briefly, the wealthy ones. The number of people with comparable financial assets going into retirement is declining precipitously. And so um, this is not a model. It's not now jobs and wealthy retirees. We have a period in which we have a group of people who worked for IBM and have great God bless, have great benefits and, and, uh, and pension in retirement. But the number of people following them falls off dramatically. Um, I think this, the census estimates the people over 55 
with no retirement savings is at 28 percent. Imagine them in 10 years and what they mean for fiscal stress. Sorry for the long answer. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you, panel. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Um, nice. The Institute's gotten a lot of thank yous today, but there's a group of people that made this happen that we should really thank. Um, Ursula has been politely handing you your mi microphone all day long. Michael Cooper, who's been back there uh, filming us. Joe Chamberlain, who's kept the audio system rolling. Uh, Michelle Charbonneau, who's not been in the room, but uh, did yeoman's, Joe person's work, <laughs> uh, pulling our, our um, her presentations together at the last minute. And Patty Cadret, who uh, has overseen kind of how the room's organized and, and launched. So could we all give them a thank you? <laughs> thank you all for coming. We'd welcome your feedback about the event and what you'd like to see in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Nice to meet you.